I'd like to welcome everybody to our two, February 11, 2020 open session. We have already opened our meeting, uh, determined we had a quorum of seven members here. We had our invocation by Dr. Smith and our Pledge of Allegiance by Mr. Ronald Johnson. So we're going to go into a, uh, a uh, approval of minutes for January 14th, 2020. Have a motion by Mr. Johnson. Second, Second by Ms. Sessoms. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries 5 0. Uh, ask for most, entertain a motion for our approval of minutes in our special session on January 13th, 2020. Motion by Mr. Johnson. Second. Second by Ms. Zukowski. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries 6-0. At this time, I'll start with Mr. Wooting, Wooten. Any adjustments to the agenda? Sorry, I'm under the weather today. Thing is, uh, okay, we're going to add adjustment to the agenda for Legal Services Committee under Exhibit 8.C.6 on our agenda. All right, Ms. Grant, any adjustments? All right. Yes, A.6, yes, yep. All right, uh, Ms. Zukowski. Uh, yes, I'd like to add uh, attendance boundaries for Riverwood Middle and Clayton Middle. Uh, that would be 8.a.7. I think that, um, is that, that would be under Ms. Gill, right? I think that's exhibit 8.c.6. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Sessoms. Okay, Mr. Johnson. Okay. Dr. Williams. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, if we could please, I'd like to make an adjustment for the uh, superintendent's recognition of student leaders. Uh, our students have a senior night tonight, so I'd like to please move them up to special recognitions, and uh, I would do that uh, before Ms. Gill uh, begins their character education. All right. Uh, entertain. I'll entertain a motion for the adjustments to the agenda. Um, second by Mr. Johnson. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries 6-0. Um, at this time, Dr. Williams, I'm going to turn it over to you for the student recognitions. Thanks, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I would like to recognize two of our student leaders here, here with us tonight. Uh, we have our South Johnson High School SGA president, Kelsey Godwin. Kelsey plans to attend East Carolina University and to major in biology on a pre-optometry track. I'd also like to recognize South Johnston High School senior class president, Alexander Medlin. He is planning to attend High Point University in the fall to major in business administration with a minor in marketing and communications. Welcome to you both and uh, thank you all for attending today. And we come around here to, and shake our hands, please. Thank you all again. Thank you, Mr. Weaver, for coming out with them as well. At this time, I'll turn it over to Ms. Dolores Gill.
Good afternoon, Chairman Sutton, uh, Vice Chair Dr. Peggy Smith, members of the board, and Superintendent uh, Dr. Ben Williams. It is a pleasure to be before you this afternoon for once again our most favorite part of our board meeting, which is recognizing our fantastic students here in Johnston County Public Schools. Today, we are going to be, again, highlighting character ed in conjunction with our portrait of a graduate model. And we are going to be recognizing the trait of being a critical thinker and inquirer, which means anticipating, identifying, and evaluating issues and using resources to solve problems in a variety of contexts. Johnston County Schools is pleased to present several of our students today, and we would like to thank all of our parents and special guests for being here. And just remember, parents, you are more than happy. Please come behind our board and take any photographs with our um, students as they are being recognized. Also, all of our students receive a certificate signed by our superintendent and another special prize that they get upon uh, leaving the room today, and we are excited to be able to highlight them. Um, the first person we have is Evan Braswell. Evan here. Evan is from Benson Elementary, and Evan is in fourth grade. Evan is a bright student with an observant nature and demonstrates critical thinking in all aspects of learning. In math, he enjoys analyzing and thinking outside the box. In reading, enjoys reasoning through the actions of the characters to understand behavior. Very good at critical thinking, and it's evident when he has to apply information that's not written in the text. Evan does not allow the challenge to become an obstacle. Science and social studies is an avenue to explore the world and all of the complex issues. Naturally inquisitive and seeks to find answers at all times. Evan is very knowledgeable of all the different resources and can use all of these resources to find answers and to solve problems. Evan is a tremendous asset to Benson Elementary. Thank you so very much for what you do for Benson. And Evan, Benson Elementary is proud of you and Johnson County Public Schools is too. So let's give Evan a hand. Thank you. All right. Our next recognition is from Four Oaks Elementary School, Grayson Short. Grace. Grayson is in fifth grade. Grayson puts forth his best effort every day, is able to use a variety of contexts such as visuals, manipulatives, and communication in order to apply critical thinking skills. He is able to inquire learning and relate it to real world experiences. Many days, he may be unsure of how to complete a task, but what Grayson is so amazing at is never giving up. He will sit at his assignment endlessly, repeating the task over and over again without giving up. He has such a desire to learn and does a phenomenal job completing tasks as instructed and putting forth effort to learn new material. We are excited that Grayson is representing Four Oaks Elementary School. Grayson makes our nest at Four Oaks Elementary School a better place with his hard work and determination. Four Oaks Elementary is very proud of you, Grayson, and we are too here in Johnston County. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Our next recognition is Caitlin Massengill, and Caitlin is at Four Oaks Middle School in the eighth grade. Caitlin is a natural problem solver who works diligently each day to be her best. She's inquisitive, takes it upon herself to be well informed. She's an independent thinker who is open-minded when presenting with new ideas. When working with others, she's objective and fair, but also introspective and analytical. Caitlin is dependable and genuinely desires to learn and grow. As a Math 1 and English 1 student, she pays close attention to details and encourages others to do the same. She's self-aware, self-confident in her abilities, and always looks for opportunities to grow critically. She is compassionate, 
and empathetic and willing to challenge ideas in order to understand and evolve. She is a master organizer, a common sense thinker, and an incredibly hard worker. Four Oaks Middle School is very proud of you, and so are we here in Johnston County. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have from Meadow School, Alan Morales, who is also in the eighth grade. Alan demonstrates critical thinking skills by carefully analyzing a given problem or scenario before jumping to a quick solution. His ideas are often unique because he seeks more information and he evaluates data before coming up with an answer. He's a member of the Science Olympiad team, the STEM club, and Math Counts. He's an academic leader in the classroom and demonstrates kindness and responsibility. He questions logic and draws conclusions and derives information all by himself. He's a natural born leader with much knowledge ready to take on the world. We can't wait to see what's in store for him here at Meadow School. They are very proud of you. And so are we here in Johnston County Public Schools. Congratulations. Next, from South Johnston High School, we have Callie Dunn in the 11th grade. Callie has always been a student that engages in pro-social behavior with her peers and staff. Callie makes it her daily mission to help teachers and classmates solve problems. She is a helper and will go above and beyond for others. She's inquisitive, attentive, and demonstrates critical thinking every day. Callie seeks opportunities to help, and her kindness is observable inside and outside the classroom. In the school environment, she consistently demonstrates empathy for others and is compassionate, and it does not go unnoticed. She's a great representative of South Johnston High School, and they are very excited to nominate her as their February Character Education Student of the Month. Callie Dunn, they're proud of you at South Johnston, and we are too in Johnston County. Thank you so much. <laughs> very proud of this young lady because she thought she might not come up here by herself but now we're friends right okay all right next from micro elementary i have mary grace moore and she is in kindergarten mary grace is a bright and talented student recently her teacher posed a question to the class where students were asked to draw a portrait of a great american her dad thought it was going to be him and her dad is Mr. Moore, who works with us here in the school system. However, Mary Grace used her critical thinking to determine who that great American could be. And it was none other than her principal, T.J. Parrish. And she, wrote a, she did a beautiful picture of him as well. Her view of Mr. Parrish has made its way through the school and members of the community. And Micro couldn't be more proud of you, Mary Grace. And so are we in Johnston County Public School. Congratulations. Good job. <laughs> and now we would love for all of our folks who are recognized to come and shake the hands of our board members who are excited to have you here today. Now you see why this is our favorite time. All right, next we get to acknowledge some fantastic adults who work with us here in the school system. I have next for you board exhibit 5-2, um, and that is our newly certified national board teachers, 
We are delighted here in a moment. We are going to have Miss Kathy Price, who oversees this section of our program, to come up and recognize these folks. But I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the National Board Certification process. The National Board Certification is a rigorous, multi-year process of self-reflection and growth sponsored by the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. The mission of the organization is to advance student learning and achievement by establishing the definitive standards and systems for certifying accomplished ed educators. Each year, many teachers complete this process, but less than 50% are successful in earning this credential. The National Board for Professional Teaching Standards recently announced the names of the newly hired National Board teachers, and we can't wait to highlight them here and in the future in our media so that they can see all the fantastic things they have done. So I'm going to turn it over at this time to Miss Price. Is she here? And she is going to introduce you to these fabulous teachers. Greetings. Thank you. We are delighted to be here to celebrate our newly certified National Board teachers. With me today, I have Dr. Casey, who works with me at the district office to ensure that our candidates get the right support. And with me today, we also have a teacher from Cleveland High School, Melissa Pierce, and she is very instrumental in setting up, um, planning, and facilitating the initial and renewal support sessions. So without ado, let's celebrate our new teachers. We have Robin Dudash from Riverdale Elementary with Early Childhood, Elizabeth Gherkin, West Johnston High School, English Language Arts, Karen Kenny Lassiter, Four Oaks Elementary, Early Childhood, Miranda Lewis, Pine Level Elementary, Early Childhood, Patricia Sela, Wilson's Mills Elementary, Early Childhood, Denise Sumner, Four Oaks Elementary, Early Childhood, Laura Warren, Micro Elementary, Library Media, and Carmen White at McGee's Crossroads Elementary with School Counseling for Early Childhood. Congratulations. Mr. Vetrano, before you start, you know, that's a lot of hard work for the teachers, um, national boards, and we commend each one of our uh, national board certified teachers. They take it to the next level and make sure that our students are really taken care of, and it's a lot of hard work. I know my wife did it as well a couple of years back, and uh, I know what they go through to stress, so I'm, I know they're relieved. So congratulations again, Mr. Vetrano. Yes, sir. Thank you. I certainly echo your responses. It's always my privilege to stand before you and recognize outstanding employees. Our classified employee of this month is Ms. Letitia Lee. If Ms. Lee will please come forward and join me. Now, if I'm smiling a little bit too big, it's because uh, Ms. Letitia Lee is uh, one of our team members in HR. So um, sometimes I read the information up here and uh, I believe it because I'm hearing these things, but with Ms. Lee, I know it because I work with her on a daily basis. Ms. Lee serves as the licensure specialist in the Human Resources Department. She was nominated by a coworker, Ms. Carla Withrow. Ms. Withrow shared that Ms. Letitia Lee is such a positive, pleasant person and employee. Even when faced with enormous challenges, both at work and away from the office, she maintains the most positive attitude about work and life. If you want to be inspired, go by her office and your spirits will be lifted by her calm, warm nature. That is very true. 
Letitia is also an extremely effective and efficient employee. She helps employees with licensure questions and eases their concerns with her knowledge and her willingness to do what it takes, no matter how difficult the task. Letitia Lee deserves to be recognized for her outstanding dedication, work ethic, and positive attitude. Ms. Lee, I'm so glad you're a part of our team. Thank you so much for what you do each and every day, and congratulations on being our Classified Employee of the Month. Yeah. And if you'll stay right here. Next, we have our Certified Employee of the Month, Ms. Wendy Dudley. As Ms. Dudley is coming forward, I'll share with you, she serves as a PE teacher at Four Oaks Elementary School. She was nominated by a colleague, Ms. Lisa Bishop Allen. Ms. Allen shared that all PE teachers focus on educating students about the benefits of exercise, health, and overall wellness. But Wendy Dudley has taken this mission to the ultimate level. She's created a running club for the students at Four Oaks Elementary to participate on Thursdays after school with the culminating goal of running a 5K to benefit the Heart Association. Staff members have been inspired to participate in her Biggest Loser Challenge, which she helped to create uh, to concentrate on losing to a healthy weight by eating right, exercising, and assuming healthy habits for coping with stress. Representing the enrichment team on the school improvement team, she is also facilitating a school-wide transformation using PBIS, Positive Behavior Intervention and Support, to create a positive climate for learning. Considering the fact that she is doing all of these things in addition to her normal teaching of 1,100 students, this is astounding. Uh, Ms. Dudley, thank you so much for what you do at Forks Elementary School and for our school system. Congratulations on being our certified employee of the month. Thank you. And if you'll both greet the board, please. other goodies for you. Thank you again. Thank you. Dr. Williams. Yes, sir. Uh, My I apologies. I, I apologize. Yes, Mr. Johnson, we got advisory appointments. Thanks, sir. Principal David Allen at Triple S would like the reappointment of Frank Creech and Billy Lasseter for three years. Those terms would end June 2022. Also, new member appointments for Van Booth, Shimana Freeman, and Kathleen Stuckey, which will fill vacated seats. Those terms would end June 2022. Or, excuse me, June 2022. The Selma Elementary oh, me, School principal. Let that stand as a motion. Yep. The Selma Elementary School principal, Ms. Rosado, is seeking a new member appointment for three years for Zachary McLam, filling a vacant seat. That term would end June 2022. All right, we'll let that stand as a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 7 0. Now, Dr. Williams. Mr. Chairman, at this time, I would ask that the board approve consent items 8A1A through 8A1K. I intend a motion to approve the consent items 8A1A through 8A1K. So moved. Motion by Ms. Sessoms, second by Mr. Johnson. All in favor? Aye. Mr. Uh, Chairman, yes. on, on the floor is the uh, advisory board members. I'll, I second that motion. Yeah, Ron made the motion and he needed a second, so I'll second Thank that you. motion. Sir. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. And Chairman, um, I would just like to make one comment. I want to thank all of the board members that participate in those student reassignment hearings. Um, for those who have not 
um, uh, who, who may not know, our reassignments, if you take a look at the, um, at the documents, our reassignments have slowed down drastically. Uh, we no longer have a, a situation that we had in years past where um, uh, many, many, many students were being reassigned to, um, to different schools. And I just want to thank those members that come in early and stay late to um, go through those hearings and make it happen. Very good comments. Um, I appreciate everybody taking time out of their day as well to, to do that. Um, so we got, uh, we, I, I believe we had a, uh, all in favor, uh, all opposed, motion carries seven zero on the consent items. All right, we've already, we moved the recognition of uh, superintendent student leaders. So at this time, um, I'm gonna go over the operational agreement. We all had that uh, operational agreement that we discussed last time. This is on for information. We've all had time to review this document. Uh, and if, if anybody's opposed, I will not read it unless someone feels led to. I am under the weather, so I'm gonna try to save my voice. May I make another comment? Sure. <clears throat> uh, this operational agreement, as a, as a retired educator, looking back, any time that I moved into a new position, whether it was a new grade level or a new position within the school system, the first thing that I did was I always looked to see who, you know, who's doing the best job and, uh, and, and what can I pull from them to be the best that I can be in my new position. And so the policy committee really spent a lot of time looking at other school districts that are performing well in terms of their school boards. And this operational agreement is, um, is a compilation of that research. And uh, this is not something that two or three people sat around one, one afternoon at the kitchen table and dreamed up. Uh, but it is research-based, and these are practices that are being utilized all across the nation with school boards um, as they not only embrace but practice their codes of ethics. Thank you, Ms. Sessoms, and I believe that um, we were looking at uh, this going into Lincoln into uh, policy 1550, if that's, not, if that's correct. Um, any more comments on the operation agreement? I have a comment. Um, I appreciate all the hard work that our policy committee has put into this and all the other policies that you guys work on. There's tons of them. Um, I raised some concerns with a couple of you on some of this. For, for it to be, you know, in the public, it's called the unity agreement. Um, and... And I think that is the goal, is unity. And for there to be unity, I think this is one of those documents that we really have to have 100% consensus on. If it's not 7-0, it's hard to say it's a unity agreement. So there are some concerns still with some of this. I would like uh, for... I know the chairman and I talked about this, maybe the finance committee to work on this together too, if there's any recommendations for changes um, and maybe submit that back to you guys, but us to meet as a group. Um, I, 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 for a good example, the chairman speaks for the board and the media in most circumstances, that is a perfectly good way to handle things. When we have a split boat, he's going to speak for the majority, but the person who votes separate is going to be very passionate about why they voted the way they voted and may want to share that as well. Um, so I, I think that when the chairman can speak for the board, that's a great thing. But 
there's always going to be an opportunity that someone else may want to speak. Um, and, and it happens in all levels of government. The Speaker of the House may speak for the most part for the House, but that doesn't mean that another legislator is not going to speak. So there are just some things I think we could tweak a little bit better and get this to where we can get a unanimous vote. Very good comments. It's all about unity. We talked about this. Um, I'm all in favor of, of each committee reviewing this document um, and making sure that this document is something that we can um, abide by and move forward as a group of seven uh, for the betterment of Johnson County Public Schools. So I do uh, think that's a great idea, Ms. Ms. Grant, to do that for the Finance Committee to review this at your next meeting as well as the Policy Committee. And, and I just want to say one more thing too. We have some other documents like the ethics and roles of the board member and now a complaints policy. I feel like some of this is covered in that as well and it's a little bit redundant. So I, th I think that's another reason to go back and look. And, you know, I agree with you, Teresa, on that. And being someone who's been on a, you know, five to two, six to one deal, I understand that we are one governing body. And sure, I want to work together and you all want to work together. And I have all intentions of working together. But all seven of us were elected. Therefore, I think all seven of us should be able to speak and speak to an intelligible manner to disagree in an agreeable fashion. And I think that's the goal. So from here on out, if someone asks me what I think, I'm not gonna shy away from telling them. But I think it's important to do it in an agreeable fashion. Mm -hmm. I think that's the pinnacle, that's the goal. Because we're all seven here for a reason, because people want to hear from us. They want to know what they think. They didn't put just one of us here. They put all of us here. So, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I have for great respect for what you all just said, but the thing that the public needs to hear is we all vote our conscience. And if we differ on those conscience issues, then that's our privilege. Nobody's taking away the right of anybody to speak to anybody except when it comes to big, um, like, I don't even know, we're searching for a superintendent. That's, that's the chairman's job to communicate with the media. And I guess the other part I want to say is these policies have been posted on, um, it's called review, David, uh, Mr. Dr. Pierce, policy under review. And we want public input. We, we try to get as much input as we can so that when we do bring the policy, we get it. So with those two things, I um, will also say that this is a, um, a great stab at a policy that will move us forward. Does that make sense? I, I agree with everybody and I agree with Mr. Johnson and you know, it's, it's all about our delivery to the, to the media, to the public. Uh, we can agree, agree to disagree and move forward as a group in a professional manner. Um, and, and I think that's what this whole board is about, is moving forward in, in that way. So um, great comments. I think that we can, we can take this and, and continue to move it forward. It's a great strive to, to do that with the operation agreement that it is. I look forward to hearing from both sides as far as the, the uh, amendments that you would like to make. And um, I, I firmly believe that as a board, we can move forward with that and, and, and put this in place. So uh, great comments. Any other comments? I, I guess just one, um, I'm sorry. Um, this is my, 12th year being on the board and we disagreed probably when um, our former chair left to go to the legislature. We voted differently, but when we walked out of here, we all supported the decision of the majority. And I, I want us to keep that in mind is I don't want someone going out dividing us again. That's, that's the whole premise of this is to be a united board. And when we walk out and a decision's been made, we all support that decision. I mean, that's just common sense. Well, and, and that, that's uh, really an echo of what our code of ethics calls for. Um, for those who, uh, and we have several candidates in the group today, I'm glad to see those folks. Uh, 
I, I would invite all uh, of our public um, to take a look at the code of ethics for school board members and what those roles and responsibilities look like in terms at the national level as well as the state level. Um, and, and one of the things that, that comes out loud and clear in those codes or in our code of ethics is that we should not stifle another person's voice on this board. Um, because all ideas and all perspectives are valuable, but it also calls that whatever the majority of the board does, because we are a corporate body, we don't operate in and of uh, ourselves individually, that whatever the, the majority does vote on, that is that we should all support that when we walk out. So, um, you know, th that's your code, that, that is our code of ethics. Uh, because if we walk out of here split, it splits our community. And um, th the good thing is, is that every, you know, um, every two years there's an election. And so if you don't like some of the decisions that are being made, I believe we had 16 people step up for four seats this time. And, and I love that because it shows that we have a community that really cares. So every two years, there's an opportunity if you want to run to do so um, and, and be a part of that decision making. And I, for one, believe that every uh, citizen who is able-bodied should run for office at least one time. Thank you, Ms. Sessoms. Any other comments on the operation agreement? If not, then uh, the Finance Committee, Mr. Wooten as the chair, will you guys uh, make that a part of your agenda for the next meeting, as well as Dr. Smith with the Policy Committee? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the 2020 North Carolina School Board Association Legislative Committee service, um, I received a memo from the School Board Association. It says, each board is invited to nominate one board member to serve on the committee. This individual should be nominated through a vote of a full board taken in open session. The person who is nominated must be able to commit to attending both meetings. Uh, these meetings are uh, Monday, July 20th from 12 to 3. Uh, at this meeting, the committee will assemble the survey instrument to be used to establish the 2021-22 agenda. And then on Monday, September 14th from 12 to 3, this committee will discuss the survey results and use those results to set the draft agenda that will be voted on the delegate assembly at annual conference. At this time, I nominate Mr. Mike Wooten to serve on this committee. I second, and also say, Mr. Wooten, you've been to the training room at the School Boards Association. Imagine that room spread out with a round table. I mean, it's an amazing experience. Having done it, you will love your, your colleagues coming together to solve statewide issues. So good. It's an second. honor to serve. Thank you. So at this time, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Motion carries 7-0. Congratulations, Mr. Wooten. All right, moving on to Center District's contract. Um, basically, the Center District's contract went in effect uh, January of 1996, excuse me. Wow. Um, 2016, January of 2016. It is coming up on contract in 2021. I don't know what Ms. Ms. Sugowski gave me in the vitamins, but ooh. Um, at this time, you know, it's, all, it's just relevant for us to explore the cost avoidance and the savings that we have uh, had in this program since the inception and basically study all elements and to see if it's in the best interest of the school, uh, school system to move forward in a contract that's coming up uh, for renewal in January of 2021. You know, like I said, it's appropriate time to review this contract, basically to see if there's any cost savings 
um, talk to our customers. And our customers are our people that are in our facilities each and every day, our teachers, uh, custodians, anybody in the schools to see what their thoughts are and get feedback from them based upon the synergistics contract. Um, and then the cost avoidance um, is, is the major piece that, that we look at from a savings standpoint. It is a contract um, based upon that. So, and the main question is, have we learned anything to con that we can conduct this on our own with our own uh, members of our, our, our system, or do we need to move forward? So, um, with that being said, I would just like to say, you know, look into this. Dr. Williams, I would like for, for us to uh, get with Ms. Gill's group as well to, to fee get feedback from our teachers and our, our schools about, you know, their, what they see from this uh, and, and then report back to us so that the board can make a logical decision of how we need to move forward with Synergistics contract. And Chairman, uh, I'd also like to ask that our employees um, who are actually, our maintenance folks who are actually having to exercise this contract, uh, that we get feedback from them as well in, in terms of what they're seeing. Uh, uh, because I've heard in my short time on the board, I've, I've heard several folks who work in that department um, express concerns. So they're the ones who are actually on the ground seeing the, the repair piece, uh, and I think we need to hear from them as well. Mr. Chairman, um, I think I was on the board when this contract was approved, but let me go back a little bit farther in history to when Jake Jacobs was here. Dr. Pierce, you were principal at that time. Dr. Williams was the principal at that time. I think the first or second year that Ed Kroom took over the superintendency and Jake was in charge of facilities, we saved over, over a million dollars on our own. And, you know, in a, as a matter of time, those people don't have the time that Synergistics does. But on, at the same token, everybody pulled together when we knew that dollars were at stake and we got the, we got the bills down and we got really better quality treatment of our facility, of our heating and air conditioning because your natural in instinct is just turn it off and then crank it back up the next day. But according to the facilities people, that's not good business because it breaks down, it gives out sooner. So I just want us to look at all of that and it would save our district significant funds. And I, I've been told that we could not break the contract, but I think you have somebody looking at that option, do you not? We, we have, and, and basically we're so close to the end of the contract, it's time for us to re explore, see if it's appropriate for us to renew this contract as it comes up in January of 2021. Um, well, less than, yeah, a little bit less, yep. Um, and, and, you know, I've, I've done some research on their website, too, and, and there's many, many school districts across, across the nation that are using uh, this, this uh, group, as well as uh, very, uh, very large universities, such as Florida State University, University of Kentucky, um, Oklahoma State. I mean, you know, a lot of these. And then just today I, I went across Rockingham County, just renewed theirs in January of 20, uh, January 24th of this year. They, they stated a savings of uh, $3.6 million. So there's a lot of them out there that are utilizing this and receiving good benefit. But I think it's only good steward. We can only be good stewards by reviewing everything that's possible out there to make sure that we're doing what's right for Johnston County and not just reading testimonials from other counties and universities, but we need to provide, um, the, get the feedback from our, our stakeholders and our customers, the maintenance groups, the teachers and, and custodians in the, in, the, in the schools. Any other comments or on synergistics? If not, we'll move forward um, with uh, Dr. Pierce. Dr. Pierce, we're going to break about 5:55, so you got you might get a, through a couple of them. Go as fast as I can, sir. Good evening, uh, Chairman Sutton, Lady Vice Chair, Dr. Smith, Dr. Yeah. Williams, members of the board. I have three items for approval and eight for information. Let, let me uh, back up. Dr. Williams just brought some to my attention. I had it written down. 
uh, and I overlooked it. Um, we did have a, an adjustment to our agenda that went under synergistics, um, and it was the legal service, uh, legal search committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't want to, I didn't want to break in on your meeting again for the second time, but here I am again. Um, I appreciate the opportunity for letting me uh, add this to the agenda. And um, basically, before I even talk about the legal services committee that I'm hoping that the chairman will allow us to form is I'd like to thank the finance committee, which is made up of, of me, uh, Teresa Grant, and Ron Johnson. Uh, thanks for your hard work for the last couple of months. It's been, a, it's been a difficult couple of months, but it's been a worthy couple of months of digging in and rolling up our sleeves and, and going into the budget. Um, we've been tasked with so much to find dollars to go back into our classroom and your interaction the last couple of months, meeting night and day uh, to find a solution has been worthy. And I appreciate your interaction with the commissioners as well, who helped fund the uh, local funding for our school system. Um, a lot of hours have been put in, and I appreciate it. We've tasked the superintendent, the senior staff, department heads for looking into their departments and programs, going over data, going over cost of programs and contracts to make sure that we are paying for the programs that are beneficial to our students. And if they're not beneficial, then we need to take a hard look and save those dollars and put it back in the classroom and something, something different that's providing the education for our children. Also, we're looking at in-house organizations where we can consolidate jobs. Uh, not saying we're going to, we're going to uh, have a riff or cut people. Where can we be more efficient and uh, put people back in the classroom if they need to go back in the classroom? But we got to make sure our organizations are run thin to win um, because those dollars go to to our students as well. And with that being said, as we go through all expenses and departments and organizations. Um, the Finance Committee came across what we pay each and every year in legal services, and it's a big number. Um, so I'm asking, you know, as we find ways to save money, Mr. Chairman, I would ask that we could form a legal services committee to make sure that we're, fi we're maximizing our, uh, the money that we invest in legal services, whether it be the school system hiring an in-house attorney or a RFP for maybe an outsource of an attorney and an in-house attorney, or vice versa. Uh, I would like a committee to be formed with some of the policy committee, as well as the finance committee, and maybe an ex officio on that committee to make sure that we can study avenues to save money in our legal, legal fees as well. Thank you, Mr. Wooten. Um, I think it's only appropriate for us to do that as it is the taxpayers dollars and not our dollars as we uh, look forward to budgeting and I just want to commend what you said or just comment on what you said about the Finance Committee of uh, Mr. Johnson, Ms. Grant and, and yourself uh, for the hard work you guys have really dug in since January and really taken a, a deep dive into our finances and working with the uh, county commissioners to make sure that we could continue to operate. Um, I sat in on one of those meetings on a Sunday, and I know you guys were working on the weekends as well. So thank you for what you've done and continue to do uh, to make sure that we're good stewards with the taxpayers' monies of Johnston County. Um, with that being said, I would um, I will take your recommendation. Uh, to move forward with a committee. Uh, I, I think it's only appropriate for two policy committee members and two finance committee members to be on this committee. Uh, the policy, um, Dr. Peggy Smith and, and Ms. Terry Sessoms, and then on the finance, Ms. Teresa Grant and Ronald Johnson, and then Mike, you as an alternate, uh, if one of those cannot attend those, those committee, those meetings. Um, I will say that, um, you know, as far as a timeline, do you guys have a timeline when you might be able to bring information back to the entire board? I would say we could we could provide a timeline after our first meeting. So if we can just, we'll set the first meeting and then we'll provide you with a timeline. 
In order for this to be legal and proper, are you making a, a motion? I am making a motion. Motion's on the table. Motion by Mr. Wooten to form the committee. Uh, second by Mr. Johnson. Uh, and, and any comments at this time? All right, no further comments. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Um, and thank y'all for stepping up to do this and um, look forward to the feedback that we get from this to see how we can move forward with that. At this time, Dr. Pierce, we'll, we'll bring you back to the podium. I have three women in my home. I understand how to uh, cease and listen. So <clears throat> this time uh, we have policy code 1541, role, members, role of board members in handling complaints. Policy 1541 is a new policy. This policy outlines the procedures for when board members receive a complaint, concern, or inquiry from a parent, citizen, or employee concerning a school matter. The following revisions have been made since it was presented in our January meeting and have been added. That the Johnson County Board of Education members are a governing body. Daily operations of the school district are the primary function of the superintendent and or his or her designee, as in General Statute 115C-276, duties of the superintendent. And employees concerns, employee concerns were also added as a complaint. So I think we did not have the word employee in there before, and so we added the word employee uh, into to that as well. Finally, concerned parent or citizens or employees may also follow the procedure set forth in Policy 4300, which is our, stu our student parent grievance policy, or Policy 5240, our employee grievance policy, to address concerns. And I would also like to make sure that we say that any concerns, because this was another thing that came forward for information, any concerns about the superintendent shall be directed to the board chair who will consult with the board attorney. Those things were added. So it is the recommendation of the POS Review Committee to adopt policy 1541 and it is presented for approval. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Dr. Smith and a second by Ms. Zukowski on policy code 1541, role of board members in handling complaints. Any comments? I do. So second paragraph, individual board member who receives a complaint uh, goes on to say, refer the person to the appropriate school administrator when appropriate. Um, if it's uh, if it's an employee, uh, they might would like that to come further sometimes. So rather than just school administrator, do we want to add uh, deputy superintendent, area superintendent, or uh, I'm not sure what category we would put there. But then the next paragraph goes on, the board member shall and will refer the complaint concern and inquire to the superintendent. So I'm a little bit confused, or maybe I'm missing something. The first one says refer it to the school administrator. Second one says refer it to the superintendent, but I don't think we're talking about two different things the way I read it. And if it is uh, on that third paragraph, refer the inquiry to the superintendent, might want to add area superintendents or area superintendents. I believe when we were writing this policy and members of the committee, if you'll please correct me if I'm incorrect, um, this policy was written that way for us trying to advise the parent to go to the principal or to the teacher to follow that chain of command. And then along aside that, also let the superintendent know that a complaint has been filed. Mm -hmm. So we're not handling the complaint itself, but we're saying, uh, Ms. Grant, if you have a problem with your teacher, please first address your teacher and then go to your principal. I will met, let the area superintendent or the superintendent know that you have brought this to my attention. So we're saying, uh, if the complaint comes, doesn't matter who it came from, parent, interested citizen, or employee, that you do both. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and sometimes the parent 
generally when a parent reaches out to us, at least in my experience, uh, they've already gone to the school administrator and they're not happy. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And, and so they want it to go to uh, the superintendent. And I would say um, a lot of times that is the same situation for the employee. Absolutely. But if everyone remembers when Dr. Cosby was here and he kind of educated the board on how to handle complaints, we always remind the parent that the chain of command is to go here, then here, and then also relate to the parent that we would also communicate that with the appropriate person above our at central office. And I think that step-by-step step is articulated in our grievance policy to an extent, too. If you don't get satisfaction, here's your next layer. You're not satisfied there, then the board becomes your final arbiter, which is why we don't need to hear about it, because we can't be unbiased if we've been talking about it and, and, and have preconceived notions. I do have, a, I do have a, an edit, if you know how I like to edit. Yes, Miss Grant found this one, so this is a kudo to Miss Grant. Um, in the second paragraph, appropriate school administrator would make more sense if it said school-based, school-based administrator. Not a big deal. On that third paragraph to the superintendent, Dr. Williams, do you want that always to be superintendent? Do you? Sometimes we refer things to the area superintendent rather than you. Uh, what is your pleasure? <laughs> Designee. Normally add or designee. Correct, yes, sir. Superintendent's designee. So do we need to adjust the motion to include the change school-based administrator and superintendent or superintendent's designee? Yes, yes we do. I so move that we do that. <laughs> All, right. All right, so um, we have a motion to amend the motion with the uh, school-based administrator as well as superintendent designee, correct? And we have a second by Ms. Zukowski. Uh, any further comments on this policy? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no? No. All right, motion carries 6-1. At this time, we're gonna pause for a second to uh, have our public comments, and once our public comment is over, we will uh, take a five minute break. So at this time, tonight we have one speaker signed up for public comment. Citizens who have signed up to address the board during public comment will be called upon as they signed up and we'll have three minutes to address the board. The board suggests that specific personnel or student matters be addressed to the school principal, the Johnson County Public School System official responsible for the program or facility, or to the superintendent and are not appropriate for this setting. So tonight we have Mr. Tim Stevens who would like to uh, have public comment with us, present to the board. Welcome Mr. Stevens. <coughs> Good evening. My name's Tim Stevens. I'm pastor of the Micro First Baptist Church, been there for 41 years. My wife and I also own and operate Williamsburg Woodcraft, which is a small millwork manufacturing business in Selma. More importantly than that, I'm the father of three children, all three of which attended Johnson County Schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. I have a granddaughter who attended Johnson County Schools from kindergarten through the 12th grade. I have a grandson and a granddaughter who are in the first grade. Um, I myself attended Johnson County Schools in the third, fourth, and fifth grade, Miss Sanders, Miss Lee, and Miss Gunner. Some of you might remember some of them. Um, our daughter and her husband both teach in Johnson County Schools. She's a kindergarten teacher at Glendale Kinley Elementary School, and he is a PE teacher at Archer Lodge Middle School. So I have more than a passing interest in what's happening in our schools today. Let me say, first of all, that I'm not here because I'm mad at anybody. Uh, as far as I know, all the members of this board and everyone that works in the school system are good and honest people. I don't have any reason to believe that anyone's done anything illegal. That being said, I do believe that there are major problems with our school system. 
I believe at, at least part of the root of that problem is that the people on this board and even so many of the people that work in the central office are at times completely out of touch with reality. The school system is really consisted of two entities, one of which is the schools and the other is the central office. The central office is a little world unto itself. And um, an example of how out of touch public education is at times with the common person. A number of years ago, I was on the uh, advisory board in North Johnson. I'm a pastor, so three minutes is probably not. Um, I was on the advisory council at North Johnson. We got the calendar for that year, and we were going to school on Memorial Day, and I questioned about it, and I was told, well, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be out for the whole summer. And I said, I'm not going to be. I want to take my kids to the beach that weekend. My kids uh, attended school, never missed a day of school, so they were in school that day. Never missed a day from the time they started. Anyway, through all of that, and i got a whole lot more I want to say. <clears throat> I may come back next month for three more minutes. But uh, I, I want to say to you, that I think there's a couple things you ought to do. You're looking for a superintendent right now. The only place you're looking is among other superintendents. If you go to the same place to find your new superintendent, you're going to get the same thing you had before. If you get the same thing you had before, you're going to get the same results you had before. I ask the leave of the board to continue for a minute. Proceed, Mr. Pastor Stevens. Um, so I'd like to make a couple of suggestions. First thing I think needs to happen is you immediately need to put a hold on the search for a superintendent. I'd ask that you give Dr. Williams a one or two year contract to serve as interim superintendent. He's fully qualified. I think he has the complete sort of uh, support of the people in our county and the people in our schools. Then I think that you ought to search for a business development consultant, somebody whose background is in working in troubled, large corporations and come in and examine everything you're doing. Now, Mr. Wooten spoke a few minutes ago about some things that are exactly the kind of things I'm talking about. But I think you need to look at everything that's being done. You absolutely need to look at this central office. And I don't know how many people, I've asked two or three different times for how many people there are that work for Johnson County Schools that never come directly in contact with a student in a given day. Never been able to get that number but I'm positive that it's too many. I think you ought to try to find a way to reduce the number of people that work in this central office and come back down to earth. Uh, you don't need a cabinet. You don't need a chief of staff. You need people. You need people doing jobs. And I, that's not a derogatory toward the people that are in those positions. It's just when you say it that way, things look different. And I encourage you to find a way to connect with the citizens of this county. Every time you spend a dollar, Somebody had to give that dollar up as a tax. They had to work for it. And you need to remember that. Every time you do anything, somebody's dollar was just spent. And uh, the people of this county will support you. They will support our schools, and they do support our schools. As long as they feel like the things you're doing are absolutely in the best interest of our kids and our schools. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor Stevens. We'll take those comments. We appreciate you showing the support to Johnson County Public Schools and everything that you do for our communities as well. So thank you for being in attendance. Um, at this time, we'll take a five-minute break.
Dr. Pierce. Thank you. Thank you. So our second policy that is on is policy code 5145, drug and alcohol testing of commercial motor vehicle operators. Uh, policy 5145 was last amended on June 11, 2013. This policy was revised to update the clearinghouse reporting requirements. This policy was temporarily approved last month at exigent circumstances due to it needing to meet the deadline to get started. No additional revisions have been made. So it is the recommendation of the Policy Review Committee to amend policy 5145 and it is presented for final approval. I'll entertain a motion for policy 5145. Motion by Mr. Johnson. Second. Second by Mr. Wooten. Any comments? No comments. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Policy code 2200 public records was last amended on December 11, 2001. This policy was revised to update the general record schedule of local government agencies. It defines a public record and it outlines the duties of the record officer. No additional revisions have been made since being presented for information last month. So it is the recommendation of the Policy Review Committee to amend policy 2200 and it is presented for approval. Entertain a motion for policy 2200. Motion by Mr. Wooten, second by Mr. Johnson. Any comments? I would like to add, add that we will be receiving a regulation uh, in regards to this for our review, and it's basically a click fee that other counties have on this as well. Um, and Wake County adopted this, but they're a lot higher per page. We're look, the regulation that we'll receive tonight is 10 cents per page if it exceeds 100 pages. Um, for, for us, so that will be something for us to review um, to go along with this, this policy. So we have a motion and a second. Any other comments? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Policy 1012 Board Authority and Duties. Policy 1012 is a new board policy. This policy has been provided as a sample from the North Carolina School Board Association and outlines the authority and duties of the Board of Education. And so it is the recommendation of the Policy Review Committee to adopt Policy 1012 and it is presented for information. Policy 1550, Code of Ethics and Responsibilities for School Board Members. Policy 1550 was adopted on December 12, 2017. This policy outlines board members' ethical um, requirements as required in General Statute 160A-86 and General Statute 115C-47. This policy has been revised to add the following. All board members shall sign the JCPS Board of Education Operation Agreement upon adoption in June and at the annual organizational meeting of the board each December. It is the recommendation of the Policy Review Committee to amend Policy 1550 and it is presented for information. Policy Code 5170, Staff Participation in Political Activities. Policy 5170 was last amended on August 13, 2002. This policy has been a, uh, revised to be in alignment with Policy 2205, Distribution and Display of Non-School Materials. And just to give you some background, we had two policies that were in conflict with each other, and so uh, that's why this revision is being done. Uh, specifically, it talks about the uh, section C, subsection four states, in order to uh, minimize disruptions to the learning environment, political campaign materials may not be distributed to students or employees, including through employee mailboxes or email, or made available on school grounds during school time or at school events. However, on election day, posters and printed materials are permitted at school buildings used as polling places in accordance with the state law and the Board of Elections requirements. This provision does not prohibit a teacher from using political literature or campaign material for instructional purposes. However, any teacher using these materials for instructional purposes shall not use his or her position to promote a particular candidate, party, or position on a specific issue. The teacher shall use a variety of materials that represent balanced and diverse viewpoints on the political spectrum. And so it is the recommendation of the Policy Review Committee to amend Policy 5170, and it is presented for information. Uh, 
appreciate the head nod and it's getting me through. Policy 7800 was last amended on April 8, 2008. This policy has been revised to state the following. The board shall receive the audit report no later than December 1st. A copy of the annual audit will be provided to all newly elected board members and at the discretion of a majority vote of the Board of Education, a wellness audit will be completed in January of the previous physical year. And so it is the recommendation of the POS Review Committee to amend policy 7800 and it is presented for information. I have one question on that. So is that going to be an annual thing? I thought we said last time maybe every three years, but are we looking at the wellness audit being annually? It's the wellness, at, wellness is at the, at, at, I'm sorry, it's at the discretion of the board. If, if it's um, expedient to do one, the board can request it, but there's no regulation, nothing in the policy that would say you have to do it every three years or you have to do it every year. The audit audit is a yearly process. Yes, I understand That's that. our, our um, contracted services. This would be a, we need to figure out where all the money's going. We're going to do that this year. Does that make sense? Uh, right. I, I know. And when, but when we voted on having the, aud the wellness audit last time, I think coming, when, that's coming up. when Mike um, made that motion, we yeah. talked about doing it every three years. So I, I realize it's at our discretion, but I don't know if we want to put something like a, at least every three years or? I think we did mention something about three years in that motion um, was, was about the wellness audit. We can, okay, we can move to that, okay. All right, policy code 4225. Uh, prohibition against discrimination, harassment, and bullying. Policy 4225 was last adopted on December 8, 2009. This policy has been revised to meet the expectation of policy 4010 harassment, which was adopted on August 13, 2012, excuse me, 2002, and policy 2006 discrimination, which was adopted on January 13, 2015. The revisions are from the North Carolina School Board Association sample policy and include definitions, how to report, and adds the word discrimination to all sections. With this revision, the policy would delete policy 2006 discrimination and policy 4010 harassment and put it all into this one policy. So it is the recommendation of the policy review committee to amend policy 4225 and is presented for information. All right, policy code 1725, 4015, 5225, procedures for handling discrimination, harassment, and bullying complaint. Uh, this is our first time as a board uh, looking at information and adopting a policy that has three policy codes. And so I'd like to give you a quick update on why that is the case. The reason behind that is so that it is sitting in all series of board policy where someone might go and look for it so that it's not hard to find. All right, and so that's the recommendation that I've been given. Uh, so that's why it has three different numbers there. So it is a new policy taken from the North Carolina School Board Association sample policies. This process uh, pro uh, provided in the policy are designated for those individuals who believe that they may have been discriminated against, bullied, or harassed in violation of policy 4225 or policy 3260, non-discrimination on the basis of disability. Individuals who have witnessed or have reliable information that another person has been subjected or subject to unlawful discrimination, harassment, or bullying, also shall report such violations to one of the school system official listed in subsection C1 of this policy. Reports may also be made anonymously, and just for clarification, that has been put up on our website through the tip line, as you'll see in the policy of how you can do anonymous tips. It is the recommendation of the Policy Review Committee to adopt policy 1725, 4015, and 52. Uh, 25, which is one policy, and it is presented for information. I'm surprised we missed this one, but the way you read it is correct. The way it's written is incorrect. Add the D to subjected. I got it. Policy code 4300, student and parent grievances. 
It was last amended on November 12, 2014. This policy has been revised to include the recommendations from the North Carolina School Board Association sample policy. This policy states that the procedures for how students, parents, guardians, and legal custodian may initiate the grievance procedure when they believe that a final, administra uh, a final administrative decision has been violated uh, any board policy or state or federal law or regulation. It is the recommendation of the Policy Review Committee to adopt 4300 and it is presented for information. Good. Wow, and last but not least, Policy uh, 5240. Dr. Pierce, uh, I have, I have one sorry. question on that. Let me back back up, and I'm, I may have missed it. There's a lot here. <laughs> um, Hold on. Dang, I went too far. So it says uh, B1, mandatory reporting by school employees, an employee who does not promptly report possible discrimination, harassment, or bullying shall be subject to disciplinary disciplinary action. Uh, the part I'm wondering if I missed is if something is reported, say to a supervisor or whatever, and it's not handled, is there similar language for that? I'm more than sure that it is. I don't know if I can point to where it at, is at it right now, but I will promise you that we will go back and find okay. that information because I know that's been discussed. That there, there is a duty to report. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. There should be a consequence somewhere in the policy and procedures for failure yes, to but act if as they're well. not, Yes, yeah. that. Here it is. It's, it's in C, failure by the official at any step to communicate a decision within the specified time limit. I'm sorry, I'm not talking properly. It's in C, second paragraph, failure by the official at any step to communicate a decision within the specified time limit will permit the grievant to appeal the grievance to the next step. So there is a, there is a process spelled out for not reporting. And then somewhere... Well, and I understand there's a process if it's not reported, but they're, they're also... I mean, we're saying... I know it's in here. This is the consequence for the person who fails to act on the concern. But I, I, I'm like you, I think it's here, but I don't see it. It's right about conducting the investigation of the subsection E that says failure to investigate and or address claims of discrimination, harassment, or bullying shall result in disciplinary action. All right, thank you. And I said it was a long again. document I missed. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, It's in uh, section D under uh, two conducting, it's right above two conducting the investigation. So it's a last, it's small letter E under subsection D1, I think. It, I don't have, I can't put it all in one. I word. found it, thank you. And there should be a separate policy for failure to act within the scope of your duty somewhere in our Johnson County Schools handbook. All right, and so 4,300, we're good. Parent grievance and 5,240 employee grievance policy was last submitted on August 13, 2002. This policy has been revised to include the recommendations from the School Board Association sample policy. This policy states the procedures for how an employee should first seek to resolve any complaint with his or her immediate supervisor through informal discussions. If such discussions do not resolve the matter informally and the employee believes that he or she her complaint rises to the level of a grievance as defined then the employee may initiate a formal grievance as described in this policy in an effort to seek an equitable solution so it is the recommendation of the post review committee to adopt policy 5240 and it is presented for information thank you dr pierce dr coates
Thank you. Good afternoon, or rather good evening now. Chairman Sutton, Madam Vice Chair, Dr. Smith, board members, and Dr. Williams. This afternoon, I have only one item for you, and that is Board Exhibit 8B1, the quarterly update of the district strategic plan. School improvement is housed in our department, but as you will see from today's presentation, it is a very collaborative effort across district divisions. When we were charged with creating a district strategic plan, we looked at what leading districts and what leading schools do as defined by our Department of Public Instruction. Today, you will hear updates from a variety of people, so please note the presenter if you have questions about any given section, and we will address those questions at the end of the entire presentation. So at this time, I welcome up here to talk to you our Executive Director of School Improvement and Accountability, Ms. Christy Stevenson. Good evening, Chairman Sutton and Lady Vice Chair, Dr. Smith. Back in September, we presented our district strategic plan and um, just as a reminder of our goal, our overarching goal is that Johnston County Public Schools supports a district-wide culture where all instructional staff analyze student data, reflect on their practice, collaborate with their peers, and incorporate best practice teaching strategies to ensure high levels of learning and increase student achievement for all students. Through this goal, it will be measured at the end of 23-24 by all of our schools reaching um, a letter grade of A, B, or C. Um, so through the strategies or through our objectives, there are, are five objectives outlined in our plan. Working together, these will help increase overall student achievement. The past several months since our last update, um, Tamara Thomas, who I have who is our Director of School Improvement, and she's with me today. She's been working with our teams across the different um, objective areas to really look at strategic planning. So I'm gonna let her come and talk about the work that she's been doing. Great evening. This is some intense work. This strict strategic planning is not an easy feat. And it really does take everyone, like you, my voice is kind of going, so bear with me a little bit tonight. So in October of 2019, and there were many pieces that took place prior to this, but specifically looking in October, we um, looked at the actual NCDPI CNA rubric, which is a research-based item. And what this does is it tells us there's a rubric specifically for the district and a rubric specifically for schools. And if you could click on that just for a moment, please. So this rubric tells you specifically how schools should be performing if they are a leading school, a school that is perhaps just emerging, lacking, embedded, we look at those four judgment areas. And then it's broken into six dimensions. So as you can see on the screen, your first dimension is instructional excellence and alignment, which is what we're discussing tonight for uh, CIA. So instructional excellence and alignment, part one, teaching and learning. Instructional excellence and alignment, part two, which is support for student achievement. That's actually the largest section of the rubric by right because it's support for student achievement. So you're looking at attendance, you're looking at suspension rates, you're looking at all of your subgroups. What are we doing to extend learning? AIG, everything you can think of falls right in there and our healthy meals falls in there as well. Then you have leadership capacity. We have professional capacity. We have dimension D, planning and operational effectiveness, and then your last dimension, which is certainly not the least, I think is the most important, our families and our communities. All right, and so that's there for, your, for you to go ahead and glance at when your free time is already linked to the presentation, and we'll come right back out of that. We used the rubric and we actually 
um, when you look at the strategic plan, the areas are, those objectives are aligned to the actual rubric. So on the next slide, if you could, thank you. In November, what we did was we looked at not just the rubric, but we looked at those areas in the rubric after doing a walkthrough, like a gallery walk. We looked at those areas that are germane to CIA. And so there were about 19 areas, and it went across to different dimensions. Remember, there's six dimensions in there, right? And so as we did a self-reflection in CIA, we rated ourselves in those areas using the four judgment levels, lacking, emerging, embedded, and leading. But then we said, you know what, that's just not enough for us to self-reflect, to determine what needs to happen next. So then we decided in November, let's do a root cause analysis. Let's try to get to the root of why there are barriers to our improvement in the district. So some of the questions in this root cause analysis activity, and when I say we, that means those of us who were in CIA working together for this particular portion. So in the root cause analysis, one example was professional development initiatives are not always strategically and collaboratively selected, sustained, and monitored for the fidelity of implementation aligned with the district strategic plan. Why? Hmm. Another question we looked at for the root cause analysis. The district does not consistently monitor the curricular expectations placed on all schools. Why? And so we did this activity in smaller groups. And it was interesting when we put all of the trends together to see, well, what is the root cause? And there were many things that kept popping up across the groups that did this root cause analysis within CIA. And some of that included continuous leadership changes or barriers to improvement or lack of accountability. And constraints were also constraints to continuous improvement across the district. And so then we don't just stop at the root cause analysis. Now we want to look at, well, what do our principals think? I mean, these are major stakeholders. So let's hear from them. And we, allowed, we had them do the same gallery walk in December because we had a half day school improvement teams retreat, which was phenomenal. So they came out, they did the gallery walk, and we looked at their feedback as well, which was very helpful. And so now our teams continue to meet to develop the areas that we saw earlier on the other slide, if you don't mind just to going backwards, one. So those areas, those five objectives, guaranteed and viable curriculum, climate of collaboration and reflection, post-secondary culture, instructional supports, informed social emotional learning practices, and professional capacity coaching support. We can go in order. All right, so with that, we had the feedback in December 2019 from the principals, and action teams have been working together. So those action teams are formed around those five objective areas as well. And so let me show you an example of what we've done. The action teams have specific indicators that come right out of the district rubric, and it's all in NC Star, so you know NC Star is the platform where we house our school improvement plans, right? So if we click on where it says NC Star District Indicators, and this will be fun when you have more free time. We can't do this all tonight. But if you see on the first one, A01, it says, the superintendent and other central office staff are accountable for district and school improvement and student learning outcomes. Well, what does that mean? So glad you asked. If you click on A01, it's all hyperlinked. Now look at what comes up. On A01, you have, and I can't quite see it from here, but improving the school, can someone see that here? Improving the school, very good. And then under the indicator, what does that say? Now this is where it gets wonderful. Thank you so much, Tracy. Here's what happens next, right? You have an explanation, right? But then there are also some guiding questions. So if you could help me again, just a little bit on the, I appreciate it so much. So if we look at just some of the guide, let's look at the explanation really quickly, and then some of the questions. So the explanation is right on top. 
It says the buck has to stop somewhere. Mm -hmm. We typically hold principals accountable for their school's performance, but school progress depends a great deal on district policy, guidance, Mm. and support. Mm. Everyone respects leadership that assumes responsibility for progress. That sounds so good. Could you read some of the questions for us, right? Because this is what's wonderful. Every one of those indicators falls right into one of those six dimensions that I mentioned earlier, right? But then when you go to the research, it breaks it down for you. So just a few of the questions. Absolutely. Does your school board consider the progress of the schools and the student learning outcomes when discussing contracts with the superintendent? Does the superintendent do the same with district personnel? How do, di- how, do, how do district personnel communicate to school personnel, parents, community leaders, and taxpayers that they stand accountable for school progress and student learning outcomes? That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Yes. And so, like I said, in your free time, this is what's guiding our work. It is research-based. We got it from DPI, and this was formed in collaboration with Cambridge Education, I believe in about 2009, with the NCDPI. And so what they use this for is to conduct comprehensive needs assessments of districts. So we're looking at the quality of a district. Comprehensive needs assessments of schools, looking at the quality of schools. But then for us, it's even more powerful when we are proactive and utilize the tool just to self-assess and see how we can move through that continuum of lacking, emerging, embedded, and straight to a leading school district with several leading schools, right? And so if we could go back to the presentation itself, thank you. We want to look at evidence of impact, all right? So it's not enough to just say we have evidence of some of the the programs and platforms that we're using. So here's an example. We have HMH curriculum, right, for literacy. There's evidence of it. We see it in the schools. There's professional development that's going on just for that in all of our schools. But here's the thing. What happens next? What is the actual impact How are we measuring the effectiveness of implementation? So we're always looking at evidence, but then we're looking at what impact are we having? It's not enough to just say, we've purchased this, check, compliance. Mm -mm. That was not the original intent, right? And so some of the questions that guide our work within CIA now is how does CIA support good teaching in the classroom? right? Because we touch children every single day through the work that we're doing, right? What impact has CIA had on learning outcomes for Johnston County Public School students? We don't just sit around twiddling our thumbs. What we do has an impact on the students and the staff, and we need to determine, well, how do we know? And so as a part of the district strategic planning process, we are implementing measures so that we can actually measure what we're doing and our effectiveness, short-term and long-term. So what evidence does your team use to measure impact on learning and how is progress monitored? As you take your time to go through some of those indicators, again, on that sheet with the NC Star district indicators, there are some items there that talk to um, how to monitor, how to hold our, our schools you know, account, accountable, the whole district accountable. And you can read more about that research in our wise ways. We can move to the next slide, please. We guaranteed and viable curriculum. That's one of our objectives. As we look at that piece, they are actually working to implement the curriculum that I was just speaking about, HMH curriculum. And so with ELA, our teacher leaders have completed four of the total seven sessions that are focused on the literacy curriculum and best practices for literacy instruction. We've also had trainings for teachers at elementary, middle, and high. So high school and middle school ELA teachers have completed two out of the three sessions. And then elementary school teachers are progressing with session two. What happens is you also want to have a contingency plan. So if teachers have missed any of the sessions, our teacher leaders are trained to fill those gaps and make sure that they're able to move forward successfully. The principal voice is also critical. 
as they're the ones keeping a pulse on school level implementation efforts. So if you look at the third bullet under ELA curriculum, it says gathering data from principals around school level implementation to inform future PD needs. And so Executive Director uh, Elizabeth Dahlman had shared with me, because this is her team that she's leading up for this objective, she said that the preliminary feedback from principals is that most teachers are growing more confident with the implementation of the curriculum, which is where you really want to be at this stage, right? And also important to note, we're getting this data as we go along. We're not waiting for a year in to get this data, right? Math curriculum adoption. The committee is developing a rubric for high quality math instruction. And this math curriculum team is focused on developing the rubric, but they want to address math school-wide, not just in some schools. And it's not enough to have a plan of implementation. We have to have measures of effectiveness in place. Therefore, the evaluation plan that they are creating is intended to measure effectiveness of the curriculum, implementation efforts, and the overall impact on student learning. The last piece I want to add is that database problem solving is critical across every one of these objectives. And uh, Christy Stevenson is going to continue with that piece. So as Tamara said, um, database problem solving is key. And just to give you an update of the database problem solving that's been going on in the district since our last update, um, through our grade alike meetings, um, at each meeting we have a, um, a data portion of that meeting. Um, and we've been talking a lot about EVOS growth, looking at the growth that our students made last year, but reflecting on who are those students sitting in the seat now and what kind of growth and progress are they making. That is where we pull in our MAP data and our Lexia data. Uh, next week at, at Great Alike, we do have NWEA coming in to work with our schools on really digging in and looking at that middle of year uh, MAP data that just finished up at the end of, of January. Um, we had a Lexia session, I think it was last week or the week before, with our coaches um, to, again, kind of look at that alignment with the, the growth of our students that we're seeing. As Tamara referenced, um, we also had a mid-year SIT retreat called uh, Removing Barriers. Not only did we cover uh, database problem solving, but there were other sessions um, such as uh, school improvement planning and strategic thinking, um, a look at MTSS implementation, equity, as well as um, SEL. So we've been doing a lot surrounding database problem solving. In addition, um, Anna Milizoto, our Director of Federal Programs, oversaw our recent Federal Programs Audit um, that was conducted by uh, DPI in January, and the results that from that report will also inform our continuous improvement efforts. Um, sticking with our theme of database problem solving, we finished up our uh, fall semester EOC testing um, just after Christmas, and we are cautiously optimistic um, because the data is showing positive trends. Um, our proficiency is above where we were last fall as well as last spring. Um, but if you think about accountability, we really don't look at um, just semester performance. We look at the whole year as a whole because you have things such as scheduling that plays into the performance one semester compared to another. So if you have more honors classes scheduled one semester over another, that could impact. Um, so an implication of those positive trends is, could be strategic scheduling. And we have done kind of a deep dive at looking at our um, honors versus standard students. And the ratio of honors students compared to standard students was higher this fall than what we saw last fall. Also, we did not miss as much school. Um, if you'll remember last year, we missed several days for the hurricane. So that could all play into that. So that is why we are cautiously optimistic, but it is very exciting to see that we are trending in the right direction. Um, also wanted to mention 
Um, that report is a report out of our Math 1, Math 3, and Biology. English 2, we do not have scores back from that. It is a standard setting year for ELA, so those scores will be delayed this year with the exception of third grade at the end of the year. Third grade, um, the state will apply the current achievement standards, and this is um, for Read to Achieve, so we are able to make decisions for summer reading camp and things like that. However, the third grade will still go through the standard setting process with those standards implemented next year. Um, here's a snapshot of our MAP data, um, mid-year benchmark data. And if you will notice here, moving from file to winter, you see a dip in our proficiency. Um, this is consistent with what we saw last year. Um, we tend, um, and even when we used MAP several years ago, we always saw a dip mid-year with it picking back up by the end of the year. Um, compared to where we were last year, math, we are relatively in the same place. Um, we were at 44.5 last winter. And reading, we are slightly above where we were last year. Um, we were at 56.4 last year, so a, about a percentage point above. So this could be an indication of our um, reading, uh, implementation of a reading curriculum. Um, if we reflect back to our district strategic plan, and if you were to go in and look at the um, progress targets that we've set for each, each year, by the end of the year, our math target is set at 54. So if you look at where we are right now, we are below that mark. In reading, our target is 52, and right now we are above that mark in reading. So that is, that is a celebration that we are, are hitting the mark in, in reading, but we've still got work to do um, in math. When you look at growth, the growth target is about, should be about 50% um, of the students making growth. So you can see overall we are, are just below that, that mark. Um, Next week in Great Alikes, um, principals will be given um, this data, not only as overall, but by subgroups, so they can begin to look at co their core effectiveness and which, which grade levels are showing good growth, which grade levels may need more focus, and which subgroups are making the gains, and which ones may need more focus. And th begin thinking about the implications for instruction. Um, along with database problem solving, we know that coaching is, is critical for your database problem solving. And I'm going to turn it over to Hannah Smith. Good evening. Um, so as Christy said, now we're shifting into building capacity and coaching. How do we support our teachers? And so the model that we selected last year in supporting our teachers is the cognitive coaching model. And the goal with cognitive coaching um, is to produce self-directed people um, with um, the cognitive capacity for them to um, function both independently and as a member of a community. And so this is just supporting the way that they think. Um, and as a cognitive coach, you support and uh, serve in four ways. As a coach, as a collaborator, we point out there co-labor, we're working together. Um, as a consultant, and as an evaluator. Over the past two school years, so we started last fall and running through now, we have facilitated 11 cohorts um, and have trained 239 people. That's both our school-based administrators and central services staff, um, so that we are all on the same page in how we are supporting our teachers, how we are getting them to become self-directed thinkers. Our strategic plan for cognitive coaching is incorporating ways to continue supporting our, our um, participants beyond the eight days of training. So once they finish this training, um, how can we continue to support them so that it's truly building their capacity and they are able to apply their skills and really support their teachers? Um, our strategic plan also um, for next year is bringing in teachers so that they can start 
um, applying these skills with, st with their students and so that our students are really becoming self-directed learners as well. Another big piece of professional capacity um, in our district is MTSS, which is Multi-Tiered Systems of Support. And our goal this year in our strategic plan with MTSS is a twofold. Number one is to build a foundational understanding um, of the six critical components of MTSS. MTSS is the instructional framework for school improvement. And so we've been focusing on ensuring that all stakeholders have a foundational understanding of it. The second piece is supporting the critical infrastructures within our buildings that need to be in place for MTSS to be functioning the way that it should be. One of the strategies for MTSS that we have and is a huge necessity for this work are the MTSS and advanced learning coaches. And they are deployed in our schools. Uh, they work with our teachers um, in the building. And so keep in mind when we say MTSS here, um, MTSS is for all kids. It's for those that are struggling and those that are gifted. And in Johnston County, we focus on all of our kids from struggling to gifted. Our coaches are focused on, as Christy and Tamara were saying, database problem solving. It's critical for MTSS. Um, so at the school-based level, down to groups and individual kids. They're delivering professional development. They're developing resources. They're preparing schools for the legislation change. So in July 1, um, there's a huge policy change that's coming for um, specific learning disabilities. And so they're preparing our schools for that. Um, and then this last bullet is a mouthful, um, but it's a pretty big one because this is the huge goal for MTSS. So it's ensuring that the six critical components are aligned with core instruction. So our coaches are um, aligning their support with CIA and our psychologist to ensure the goal that our core instruction should be meeting the needs of at least 80% of our students. And if that is the case, then we should be seeing an increase in our student proficiency and our graduation rates, as well as decreasing the gap between our subgroup proficiencies. We have those gaps, and we need to be decreasing those gaps. Specifically, or especially, we have overrepresentation of subgroups in special education and students that are struggling, and underrepresentation of subgroups in those that are gifted. And so those are the crucial conversations and a lot of the database problem solving that our coaches are facilitating. So, thank you. I'm turning it over to Crystal now. Good evening. So we'd like to tell you about uh, the strategic planning that's going on in the Office of Equity, Information, and Student Services. As you know, Student Services, Social and Emotional Learning, uh, provides the wraparound services um, for our students. So we work very collaboratively with our curriculum and instruction department to make sure that our students get everything that they need, academics and holistically. Uh, our information services department, of course, is the information hub. So we provide telecommunication services, network services, uh, the E-rate infrastructure program, and power school. And then, of course, equity, which is new to the system in terms of bringing it out in front, although we've been working on it for a while, is a key ingredient to a culture of student achievement. It's a key ingredient, a ingredient to student achievement. And so what we'd like to share with you in terms of building a, our strategic plan and implementing that, the things that we've been doing as far as equity, information, and student services are concerned, you have listed in, in your packet and in this PowerPoint. We are, and you'll hear more from Ms. D. Edmondson and I later in terms of an update, but we're having ongoing principles, ongoing conversations with our principals uh, during school visits to talk about equity and to provide the resources and support that they need in order to bring this out front and actually achieve equity in, in their, on their campuses. Uh, we're also going to have a district-wide uh, equity focus, uh, a unity forum on March the 5th, Thursday, March the 5th at 6.30 at Corinth um, High School, um, Corinth Holders High School. We'll also have a focus on equity uh, in 
August public, uh, I'm sorry, professional development um, for our teachers and staff. We provide monthly equity modules for principals every month. So this is a priority for us uh, at our K-12 meetings. And in our information services unit, the data managers are also introduced to equity. And we provide hands-on, actu actually our student information coordinator uh, provides hands-on equity modules during those meetings. And then, of course, in our student services meetings, Dr. Amanda Allen leads those modules. We are, at this point, vetting SEL standards uh, to support the work of classroom teachers and developing SEL trainings and interventions for school. Now, you'll see that those verbs, vetting, developing, you may think, well, what are they doing and how long are they going to be doing that? But we are very, very serious about being intentional, strategic, and ensuring that there is an outcome. And so the planning has to take place first. We're in the infancy stages with setting foundational practices for SEL. And so what we want to do is ensure that those, those foundations are set and then we, we will implement. So as Lady Tamara Thomas said, we're not just sitting around twiddling our thumbs. We are actually working, but we do need to move pretty slowly and intentionally because we are in the infancy stages with developing the SEL practices. Also in SEL and student services, there is training being developed associated with the human trafficking and required reporting, required reporting training. We are also connecting mental health supports with students in schools. You've heard about that. So we started at, at SSSS and now we're expanding and providing uh, mental health assistance um, at additional schools. And then we are continuing to pursue monetary grants and partnerships. Uh, we know that there, is, um, there are resources out there for us to actually grab hold to, and we're working very, very closely with Dr. Cherry Johnson, who is a master. She has the Midas touch as far as uh, bringing grants to our system, and Dr. Amanda Allen has done the same thing. We actually have three um, uh, full-time positions because of the resourcefulness of Dr. Allen. So those are the things that we are doing in terms of building the strategic plan and doing our part to ensure that our students are achieving. And Dolores? Good evening. Um, out of our five main goals that we have for our district strategic plan, um, our department, uh, Chief of Staff and um, Communication, we have uh, three of those goals. And um, these goals support the main objective of our school system, which is instructional excellence and ensuring that the academic piece is where it needs to be. So the first goal that I have is safe, orderly, and positive school environment. And many of these things you see um, unrolled, can you help me? Um, thank you. Um, you see unrolled as I come up and present each month, um, but I will give you just a really brief overview where we are with district-wide safety. Um, you'll hear about our security vestibules. You've heard already about our EMP and crisis boxes. Um, it's, it's also good to know that we did a district-wide password change um, in January of 2020 upon return, and that is also for security as well. Um, we're going to be t working with our principals on a new Say Something app, which we're excited about. We've got some grant funding for mobile units to be um, signage to be put on those mobile units for our emergency management folks to be able to see them better. I, I love going by Riverwood Elementary because you can see the great big red um, notes of what uh, mobile unit number it is and that's very important because those are hard to find out. Um, and then we've got a DPI safety grant uh, that we've worked on to help us keep up with our key fob initiatives um, when this equipment begins to wear out and break and where we need it additionally. Um, our middle school camera upgrades are continuing. Um, we have finished Selma Middle and Clayton Middle. When we got into the camera projects um, for interior, exterior, for some of our older schools, it met a complete redo. So uh, again, we've talked several times about them being very methodical and making sure we had uh, tremendous ca camera coverage. 
And then we have just recently done our annual training that we do with uh, BFPE helps come in and support our um, assistant principals and then our custodians and they go back and do the retrain back in their schools for fire extinguisher training and we actually do that on our ground so folks can actually get a really good training. However, um, we do still have fire brigades out in the schools who are helping to train the staff when they come back. So we're very excited about that piece as well. Um, and then moving on, uh, the next section of our department is our planning and operational effectiveness. Everything you hear as far as um, bond flow, um, what we're getting ready to talk about later on the agenda in regards to attendance boundaries and land use, all of those pieces fall under. But some things we're specifically looking at is um, obviously our bond projects and we are providing you monthly with a cost analysis so you can see how those flow from month to month from project to project. Um, we're going to talk some about our school site we're very excited about and I've got a lot of information to share with you in the coming months um, in regards to ORED's collaboration with us. I'll give you a bit of that tonight as we look for direction um, as we look for future planning with attendance boundaries as well. Um, and then family and community engagement, which is really about how do we get the word out? How do we communicate and make sure folks know what we're doing? And um, our communications team, if you've gone to our website lately, we have been, uh, we've given it a refreshed look with some uh, user options for uh, easier for signing for our staff as well as for um, buttons that help you know where to go, I would like to, all those types of things. Our Blackboard Connect system, which we use Connect Dead, so my uh, that is um, needing to be updated. Our principals will need to do a retrain. It gives them a lot more flexibility. We're very excited about that. And then we work um, with, we have trainings with webmasters at each school as well as media liaisons at each school, which is not a new concept. We've been doing it um, for quite a while. But that helps those folks to feed us information so that we can get information out to all of our social media outlets as well as press releases, those types of things things and to tell their story. And then we have a product that we use called Meltwater. And Meltwater, what's great about it is um, if we've missed something in media coverage or we want to see the tone of our media uh, coverage that we're getting, um, we are able to use Meltwater to track that um, with that software and begin to get a picture of how much coverage we're getting subject to subject and the tone of that as well. I'll turn it over to Mr. Vertrano. Thank you, Ms. Gill. And I'm just going to speak briefly. Ms. Tracy Peden Jones serves as our system administrator, and one of her roles and responsibilities is helping to oversee recruitment and retention. And so she had uh, the effort of putting in the information in the next few slides, and I've asked her to come and share some of the updates with you. So, Tracy, oh, on this side, sorry. sorry. Thank you. Good evening. How's everyone doing tonight? Good, good. good. Can I use this one? Thank you. I appreciate it. I didn't want to take your your thunder. Um, we actually have been charged with, as a human resource team to be able to recruit a diverse and quality uh, staff as well as to retain this quality staff. Uh, so throughout the, the year we've been planning and getting ready for this is our time. This is the biggest time of recruitment. Starting in December is when we actually started going through pulling together all the job fairs and career fairs that we're going to be attending. Uh, so you would think, oh my gosh, we get to go everywhere. Well, it doesn't really work that way. Um, we've actually, uh, you know, really worked hard this year on focusing on North Carolina and staying within in the state in order to help save some uh, some money um, with our travels. Um, but one of the big things that, that we do is we have met um, with the equity team. So we're very, very fortunate that Miss Edmondson um, has actually been a part of Human Resources and now has moved to the equity team. Uh, we've been able to, to work very closely with her. She's worked with recruitment before. Uh, so in working on not only identifying the, the schools that have very good quality educational programs that we know um, through time have brought in really good teachers um, and people to come in and work in the system. Um, focusing on those as well as our historically African-American colleges and universities um, and focusing on those educational fairs. So we actually so far um, have 17 
career fairs that uh, we're going to be attending. Um, we are, there are several more, actually there's about 20 more that we are keeping universities that we're keeping our eye on waiting for information to come out in order for us to be able to register uh, and be a part of those educational fairs. So uh, we are definitely reaching out, um, you know, being that I am the recruiter, um, but the HR team, uh, thank you Mr. Vetrano, is always willing to let people on the HR team come and serve and in the past we've always been able to rely on other administrators to, to be able to go principals and assistant principals be able to go out and I'm sure we would love to have some board um, members too so we'll make sure to share those dates with you as the time comes um, so but not only do we look at you know everybody is not always great at recruiting um, but we really do look at and some of us are we all love our jobs so we always bring people in and we appreciate everyone being ambassadors um, but we also look at who wants to go where um, you know, some of us love to go back to where we graduated and some of us never want to go there again. So we do like to make sure that we're asking and looking for people who want to go to, to those places. So we actually do look really closely at who we're sending. Um, that's actually part of our, our strategies as well. Um, but we also have our big job fair. So that's always uh, a thing to look at. So we always like to announce that too, April 25th, West Johnson High School. Love for you to be there um, and be a part of that. Um, but while we're looking and getting ready and planning for all those things, please know we've been planning for our job fair uh, since the last job fair. Um, always wanting to make it bigger and better. Um, that's always what we're looking to do. Um, part of what we've been doing throughout the course of this year has also been getting our recruitment materials ready. Once again, focusing on trying to bring in a quality and diverse staff. So that's always a part of our big overall plan. Um, continuing with the recruiting, we work really hard with building relationships with uh, quite a few of our higher educational um, resources so that not only are we just there visiting and recruiting um, people, but we're actually building those relationships and we're a part of the, the community there. Um, so we actually have different um, people that serve on some of the different um, committees like the Latinum Clinical Schools Advisory Board. Um, we also on the Educational Committee at um, NC State and the Educational Core Council um, at Mount Olive. So quite a few of those actually involve the curriculum for the educators um, coming through. I do like to brag about this. We just found this out the other day that Johnston County Public Schools is noted um, by the SDPI as being one of the consistent top 10 employers of East Carolina Educator Preparation Program graduates. Was that long enough? Yeah, that just means we're awesome and we're hiring a lot of ECU people coming in. Um, so I'm a UN see graduate so we're gonna have to work on doing something over there too um, but it just does mean that we're building those relationships and we're known for for what we do um, part of what we've also been learning is it's always great to to grow your own um, and we've learned that if we can bring you in we can keep you because we're great you know people like to work with us we're a great crowd uh, so we do have a um, excuse me over 80 student interns this year we've hired quite a few of those already um, and working on getting more but we do have quite Quite a few, um, actually, um, numerous uh, student requests to have field experience within our county. We want to do that. We want to encourage people to come because, like I said, once you get here, you really don't want to go anywhere. Um, and we've actually worked on helping our student teachers to be able to stay. So just reflecting back upon, you know, what are their needs, um, giving good customer service. So instead of them waiting until the very last minute for us to try to get them to be substitutes, that's kind of moved that to the beginning. So now when they come in um, to be student teachers, do you want to substitute too? Let, let's see what we can help you with that. Um, and so they really worked hard in that department too and going ahead and getting all that ready because guess what, they like to make money. So when they finish student teaching, there's usually a few weeks before they you know, can actually get a job and things like that. Why don't you work for us during that meantime? We're great people to work with. Uh, so we're learning to, to do that, always looking forward to, um, to doing those pieces. And we also, um, we actually do have someone on the human resources that's serving um, and collaborating on the, the equity team to help us make sure that we're following um, and looking forward with that professional development as well. Not only do we want to hire you, we want to keep you. 
Um, and we're, we're learning. That's something that we're continuing to, to try to figure out um, how we can retain you. Because um, we do put, you've heard a lot of the things that um, have been said prior to, there's a lot of stuff that's going on with our employees. Um, and we want to make sure we're keeping them with us. That's a lot of professional development that we do. Uh, so we do work really closely with other, with principals and assistant principals when it comes to observations and how to help the employees to be able to do uh, well in their observations and continue to grow professionally in that manner, as well as any other skill sets um, that our employees need to be successful. Um, we do look at where people are placed. So, for example, our student teachers uh, do like to make sure we're looking at their licensure and what they can grow in and kind of the best placement for them because if they have a great student experience, uh, student teaching experience, once again, they want to stay. Uh, so we really, one of the other pieces is we have a, a commitment um, and I appreciate, um, you know, Mr. Vetrano um, and what he does is, and with this role that I currently have, not only recruitment but the systems piece, is we work every day to recruit every day and what can we do to improve the interactions and the communications that we have with all the employees and what we could do to make our processes better to make their lives easier um, and their lives better here in the school system, um, including onboarding. Um, how can we make that faster? How can we make it an easier process for, um, for our new employees who are coming on and being able to retain those? Any questions? Shall I continue back there? How, how effective or, I don't know another word, um, viable is the program with NC State for our high school students in our teacher cadet club, I don't remember what they're called, but is that going well? So we might, that, that might be a, a question better asked for um, some who are working with curriculum. I don't want to put you on the spot, but right. this that's. Is the first year, so we didn't do much. We have people in. That's what I wanted to know if we had anybody sign up to actually be a teacher. Look, I, I can get data on that, but we have, this is the first year of that partnership, and so we, we, beginning entry-level freshmen in that direction. So it's, it, it, they're not ready to go to college yet? No. Gotcha. They're freshmen in high school. But since you brought that up, one of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and actually I was at a meeting with JCC, the um, CTE, some of the CTE programs at JCC today, and it's such a wonderful opportunity, growing your own, um, because you do feel a part and you feel a part of something and you're leading up to. Uh, so just like going and personally visiting the uh, student teachers, um, having a meet and greet, you know, that would definitely be something that we would want to add to our recruitment uh, rotation is going out and, you know, making those personal relationships um, with our teachers, you know, future teachers, um, as well as my meeting at JCC this morning, you know, with the CTE that, that we have a lot of people that don't necessarily realize that you don't have to have a four-year degree for to teach certain CTE type classes. Um, so just making sure that we are um, getting that information out, but also having that relationship, um, just like some of the other committees on the other universities that we're on. Same thing with our, our own community colleges, that we're building those types of relationships with them as well. That was a good question. And thank you, and thank you everyone who presented. Oftentimes when you're talking about planning involving equity, it's often conceptual or theoretical. This seems to be very empirical, something that we can kind of gauge and observe and see the results. So I'm very satisfied with that. Um, strategic planning, I have a little familiarity with that, and you guys did a wonderful job. Not only do you cover the strategic, you cover the tactical, the operational planning, and the contingency planning, and go a step further with the organizing and the controlling aspect of planning and seeing your results and moving forward. So I'm extremely impressed with everyone who presented today, but I do have a couple questions, and I tried to keep up with who was speaking, so I might have missed it, but I believe it was Miss Smith who talked about cohorts. Um, was that, am I correct, Ms. Smith, did you talk about cohorts? Yes. And there was 11 cohorts. Can you kind of give me an example of what a cohort consists of, who's in there, how many people, and who's leading it? So there's about 35 participants in each cohort, um, and it consists, it's a mixture of principals, assistant principals, um, and folks from central office. Um, the trainers, um, currently Ashley Gibson, Director of MTSS and Coaching, and I um, are trainers and um, 
Patty and Kathy Price, and um, Josh Hostetter and Jen Roberts. So it's two people um, train, and then it's a group um, of administrators in central office. Okay, and Miss Whittington, I know at one point in time we had some presentations, and I was very interested in Miss Faison, her ideas for professional development, and I realized that you guys said you were seeking the advice and counsel of principals who are actually, you know, implementing this stuff in the school. So if I could get that professional development idea that Miss Faison had, that would be wonderful. And one more thing, who presented about this legislative changes coming in July 2020? Was that? Well, yeah. Oh, sorry, Miss Smith. Um, what are the legislative changes coming in July 2020? Because I must have missed that. Yeah. So um, there is a pretty significant policy change as to how we're going to identify students as um, specific learning disabled. Um, so a little just history numbers here in Johnston County. Um, I got these numbers this week. Currently, we have 2,453 of our students in Johnston County that are SLD. That is an increase of 100 since August of this year. Um, that makes up about 40% of our EC population. Um, SLD is the single largest category of EC. Um, and so in July uh, of this year, um, the policy change makes it that LD eligibility determination requires information through MTSS rather than the old 15-point discrepancy model. It requires us to have sufficient information from database problem solving and a tiered intervention system. So this impacts, yes, our students that are eligible for EC services, but it also impacts any kid who is struggling because they are also going through the database problem solving and tiered intervention system. And that amount of students, that is about 20% of our students, which is about 7,400 of our students in our district. Okay, now with these legislative changes coming July 1st, are we on track to be in compliance with this or how are we looking on that? And is there a penalty for not being in compliance? Uh, so we have a strategic plan for our schools um, that has outlined um, some, again, the, that building, back to our goal, the uh, uh, building foundational understanding and um, infrastructures in place. Um, and we have about 20% about of our schools are on track with the tasks that to be accomplished at this time. Mm -hmm. And um, what the barriers that we're facing is, as a, is the ongoing database problem solving. And so we're working with our schools to um, figure out um, how we can best support and get the structures that are needed in place um, so that we can move forward with database problem solving. So if 20%, that means... You know, I'm not a math major, but 80% would be not on track to be in compliance or not in compliance. Do you think what you just mentioned is going to get them in the ballpark by July 1st? The, um, when we look at the data, when we look at our schools, the overarching pattern is that one area is database problem solving. The other areas have been accomplished. So it is a, the focus of database problem solving. And so as you heard Christy speak to it and Tamar speak to it, that is something that we are all focusing on with schools. Um, it is a, a collective effort that we're working on as database problem solving. Um, and it is a critical piece because database problem solving is how we're going to be identifying students. Um, and so continuing, so, you know, next week, Grade Alike, we're going to be doing it with our principals. Um, and so just figuring out exactly what supports are needed so that those infrastructures can be in place and the, how we can build capacity within the folks in our buildings so that that can occur. This sounds like I identified a problem you already solved, ma'am. <laughs> it's a collective effort. Us and our coaches, it's a collective but effort. What, what tend to be the, the largest, I mean, what tend to be the major barriers? ...started out on the response to intervention, which is kind of the same type of thing. And then we didn't abandon, but we, we did not jump, we got off the bandwagon for the MTSS model. So we are really, our system is playing catch up, not because we're not doing our job, Correct. but because our county decided several years ago to not progress along on this path, thinking that there would be plenty of time later to get on board. So when we, while we have been training elementary and middle schools in response to intervention, which is 
similar to what we're doing with the database problem solving. If a student has a problem, what's an evidence-based intervention to help them? This is a much stronger model, and we have really just gotten back on board with it in the last couple of years. And so we took a couple of years away from it. Don't ask me why, I cannot answer. It was a decision made before any of us got here. But we're playing catch up on that. Now, what we're focusing on very hard now to the end of the year is very practical. What do you need to be doing right now? Mm -hmm. Understand that the progress monitoring data you're accumulating right now is what's going to be used in June to make these decisions, effective July 1. So we're working very strongly with our principals on that situation, that, that kind of where we are. Because that's the most important piece, is making sure we're providing, inter providing evidence-based interventions and documenting the progress of the students as those interventions are implemented with each kid based on the data applicable to that child, which is what Hannah just described, the database process. We're ready to get a speeding ticket. We're trying to do two, uh, five <laughs> years worth of work in two years. Yeah. Dr. Coates, that, what you just said is, is I don't know if, I, if the alarm went off too soon or not, but when you said we went away from MTSS a couple of years ago, how, how, how many years, maybe? I, 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 other, we had an opportunity that came in waves, and the districts who chose to be in phase one of implementation are, have been living this for several years. We chose to be in phase three, I believe, of the three-year implementation, and for some reason we just did not continue down. I don't know the answer. So a couple of years. Had we, we're probably a couple of years behind for phase three implementation school. We elected, and, and that's typical of, of what we do here, and in most cases it benefits us to not be on wave one because all the kids get out and all those things happen, and by the time we chime in, everything's worked out. But in this case, it's, uh, we're just having to catch up quickly. So my question is, um, and, and this is something that we face every year, is our EC student population at 17% or more right now, the MTSS, would that assist us with making sure that we are qualifying these students that need these, uh, you know, these extra IEPs, whatever it is, because we're way ahead of 12%, and I know Dr. Williams just went to a meeting a couple of weeks ago, uh, Wake County, one of the largest, if not the largest in the state and school district, are sitting at 11% of their population. We're implementing at, at uh, the first wave. But here's how it will help us. In the past, in the past, by the time if a student, if a student gets behind in school, by the time they get to middle or high school, there's just about always going to be a discrepancy between their performance and their ability, just because for whatever reason they're not achieving. The intent of the MTSS instructional model and process is to be sure before we get to that point that we're looking at evidence-based strategies and programs to help the student who's struggling. And tier two is the first level of that implementation. If those things don't work, then you go to tier three. And the key there is evidence-based. Like, um, we just purchased Do the Math last year, Do the Math, a math intervention for K-8. We did not have an evidence-based math intervention program in our district prior to that. But it's very, very good. And the schools that are using it are getting outstanding results and closing skill gaps. So when you can close skill gaps, um, there's a, what might have in the past presented as a learning disability might have just been a skill gap that we can correct. So that is how the model is going to help us. It's going to help us close skill gaps and hopefully if a student is identified as specific learning disabled, we've ruled out the skill gap stuff and we're targeting the true disability. And the, the beautiful circle about all that is by closing those skill gaps at an age-appropriate grade level, you're also touching their confidence and their emotional abilities to be able to perform well in school. Absolutely. So, yes, it should help us long-term. Thank well, you. Well, and, and this also, um, you know, shows the value of looking at the equity piece. I hope that we are having not 
yes, it's important to have these conversations with our principals, but we need to be giving our teachers strategies on how to be not just culturally aware, but culturally responsive. It is not enough to be aware that there are differences, but our teachers need strategies to be responsive to these different cultures, to the cultural differences. Teachers will do it if you give it to them. So I'm gonna wrap all that up by saying good job. Put the pedal to the floor and keep trucking. Thank you. It's it's a collective effort. Yeah, thank everyone who presented. It was well received and well detailed and uh, these are the types of things that we like diving into so that we know what's going on in our school system and how we can benefit as well from this information and how we can assist you all. But thank you for all the hard work you put into this presentation. It was well deserved. Chairman Sutton, uh, I'd like to ask our interim superintendent. <clears throat> I was very impressed with the total quality piece that's shining through the strategic plan. I, I really, uh, I, I, be I believe for the first time uh, since I've been on the board, and that's just a year, that we are truly looking at root causes, looking at data, and strategizing about how to improve. So I, I want to thank all of you for that effort because it's a lot of hard work to make that happen. Um, Tamara Thomas, um, I, you know, I, I've had conversations and understand that uh, West Smithfield has highly utilized your services and uh, which is very encouraging. But what I'd like to ask you, Dr. Williams, is are all of our restart schools taking advantage of this expertise? And if they're not, why not? Uh, because our, our restart schools out of all of our schools are the ones that, tr I mean, we all need to be strategically planning, but they need this kind of assistance. So I would just ask that you take a look at our restart schools and make sure that they are utilizing um, this whole team, but uh, but especially what she has brought forward because what what she's doing is just good. It's a good business model, you know. Uh, Pastor Stevens talked about bringing in a business person. Well, it's because there are business principles that work across the board, and what she shared with us is a business model for success. And if, our, if all of our restart schools are not utilizing that expertise, I want to know why. Very well said, Ms. Sessoms. Anyone else, any comments? If not, I will ask Ms. Dolores Gill to come back. All right, good evening again. Um, Chairman Wooten, um, no, you're not Chairman Wooten. It's getting late. I just got a promotion. <laughs> Chairman Sutton, Vice Chair, uh, Dr. Peggy Smith, members of the board, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. And I have five items this evening, and uh, we're going to push through those as best we can uh, to get you the information that we have. I do have Mr. Brooks Moore here, who's going to be assisting me with some aspects of tonight's uh, information, and I'm glad that he's here. He works very, very hard. Um, my first item is Board Exhibit 8C1, the North Johnston High School Entrance Improvements. The Entrance Improvements Project at North Johnston High School is a 2018 bond referendum project. I will also point that in your packets we do have um, the flow sheet that lets you know um, what this actually came in at, how does it put our bond money at this particular time. And then um, this is going to be an improvement to the front canopy at the main office entrance, improving the storm drainage and handicapped access in that school. An alternate bid was included in the bid package to provide additional parking 
as uh, well for the visitors and office staff. The plans were prepared by Queen Engineering and Design and Height and Associates. Bids were received on January 14th, 2020. You do see in your packet also the bid tabulation. Uh, Operations and Communications recommends awarding this project to our lowest responsible bidder, SON Incorporated of Clayton, for a total contract amount of $282,350. This includes accepting the alternate bids of $4,500 and $35,000 worth of built-in contingencies if we so need it. Um, so I, um, a picture of that's gonna be in our construction update of what that front looks like when Mr. Moore comes up in a second. So I'd like to present that for approval this evening. You've heard Mrs. Gill, uh, the North Johnston High School front entrance bond project. Uh, they're recommending Sun Incorporated uh, for the $282,350 as well as the alternate bids. Um, I would like to make that motion to accept Sun Incorporated. Second by Mr. Johnson, any comments? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Our next item is board exhibit um, 8C2, and that is Princeton Middle High's athletic field renovation. And um, this particular, am I correct on that, Michelle? Am I in item two? Okay. Um, this is the first project for Princeton Middle High in the 2018 bond referendum, and renovation of this field, as you recall, is critical for the combined use of middle and high school, but does not have practice fields and only one athletic field for use by football, soccer, and multiple community leagues. I will point to you that we did leave, I believe, in their packets um, last, uh, back in December, the information that um, is a reminder to you of some of the field usage, why this is a very unique situation to this particular school, and that this is also many items in it related to the drainage, um, the water on the existing track. So these pieces are necessary. Um, as you also recall, we brought in uh, multiple stakeholders from the Princeton community who um, gave their support and reach outs to the stakeholders for this particular adjustment to the bond. Um, it was work on the athletics facilities. Um, however, and rather than going with tennis courts, this was a multi-use type of improvement um, in capital to help assist more students to be reached. At this particular time, um, we are providing for you all of the specifics of how much this actually cost, how much of this is donations, and we do have a significant amount of donations. Um, I'll go back through the exhibit sheet, but I do want to point out that this amount of dollars is exactly what we put into that particular um, section of the bond for that community and everything else is coming from donations from um, both Mr. Larry McCoy as well as um, Hanson Aggregates who is also helping with this project extensively and a cost sheet is also provided. Um, it is um, an artificial sports surfacing as well as the drainage, uh, the water containment, uh, preservation of the track by doing so. And this is an exclusive market that's typically provided only on a national level. Therefore, it's very sensible for us to use a government purchasing service. So the GSA provides streamlined purchasing for government agencies and they already have completed a bid process. So um, in this situation, um, we have a vendor who has already been through all of the bidding. The Field Turf USA was awarded the three-year outdoor athletic services surfaces contract in January of 18. You'll see their proposal for completing the project and a comparison of the proposed pricing versus the contract pricing. Operations and uh, Communications Department recommends awarding the project to Field Turf for a total contract amount of $750,000 after accepting the credit 
for stone material. Um, as the money breakdown goes, um, about the total cost is $812,573.88, but we do have a donation of 60, which includes both McCoy and the stone, $62,573.88. So we would like to move forward with this. Um, we do want to get this to where um, all of the multiple groups of students can use it in the fall, and we ask for your approval to accept the bid that we have and ready to move forward. Ms. Gill, before we go any further, would you, um, would you refresh our memories about who those stakeholders were mm -hmm. for our viewing audience? Um, because uh, after, after that December meeting, I heard from several Princeton um, constituents who were not happy about the fact that there were not going to be tennis courts. So I, if you can name those people, that way we can send those complaints in that direction. Right. Um, we did receive a letter from the Advisory Council, uh, the PTA Booster Club um, as well. Um, we got a letter from the um, the league that, that's working within that community. And that particular evening, we did have the athletic director along with the soccer coach and uh, several other coaches that were there. Um, we did talk to that. Uh, we did have a joint meeting looking with um, their advisory folks, their booster folks, and went through this entire process talking about um, it was extremely important that the message got out that this was not just a project for one sport or, or one use, that uh, in order for it to even be a consideration to bring before you a commitment for all the students to get to have um, this field to be in this situation um, with the turf. Again, you know, when you're just using it for one sport, um, and you have uh, drainage issues where it's too high on one particular section of it and it's starting to damage the track. It's damaging for the track. You can only use it for the one sport. You can't have soccer out there. You can't have band practice out there because it's tearing up the grass for the one sport. So your goal in a very unique situation where you have 612 is to be able to bring this in for the entire community, for all the leagues, but as well for all the other sports that are out there as well as community events, even having community appreciation days. They just had many different ideas about that. So um, we certainly can continue to work with those groups, with our leadership at that school to get the message out about how this is a project that is not just about one entity at that school, but something for pride for the entire community to be able to stand the test of wear and tear, which is really what it comes down to, and the existing situation we have at that school is gonna to need to be fixed anyway in relation to that drainage. That's why we need the work of Mr. McCoy, we need the, the rock, all of those pieces. Um, so it, it does sound like that we need to, through the information that's being provided to us hearing it this evening, uh, to get back with leadership and let's sure that up for everyone. I just had a question um, on the line by line bid sheet. I was looking at this just for people who might see this. It said um, 17 cents, 25 cents, but that's per square foot or linear foot. Or well, I'm going to send it over now to the person who's smarter than me, Mr. Moore. Come on up. Uh, Mr. Graham, on, on the second column is the unit. Thank you so much. I, I just Your kept thinking number. nothing could be that cheap, but it's okay. by foot. Okay. Okay, so we've got um, this information in front of us. It is an action item. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Motion by Mr. Wooten, second by Ms. Zukowski. Any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. The next item that I have is Board Exhibit 8C3, which is a 2018 bond referendum update. I'd like to turn this over to Mr. Moore, and uh, he puts these updates together. He also is um, responsible for ensuring that all of these projects are go according to plan within the funding amount, so I'd just like to give him a tremendous amount of credit for what he does. Mr. Moore.
Thank you, Miss Gill, and good good evening, Chair Chairman Sutton, Lady Miss Vice Chair Dr. Peggy Smith, uh, members of the board, Dr. Williams. It is a pleasure to be before you and to present the January 2020 construction update. I do come with great news. Um, last Thursday, we conducted the pre final inspection on the 24 class classroom addition at Corinth Holders High School. That school is getting some much needed relief. I, I will add within that, just, just kind of refreshing every, everyone's me mem memory, that that in, in, encompasses 18 standard classrooms, four chemistry labs, which of which they have not been able to host the chemistry class, just just visit um, science, and two computer labs, both of which will support their distance ed learning through JCC. Um, this 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 addition will bring their capacity to eighteen hundred. I'm not doing my job if I don't tell you that there's still three hundred over capacity and we petitioned for a new high school in the last bond and we got funding for for an addition and the new elementary school so just wanted to throw that out there <laughs> um, they are currently right now whenever ever they move in on fe February 24th they are putting 21 teachers who are currently on roaming carts in those rooms. And then for the summer, they have a hard turnover over where some some of their core that are in mobiles are coming in. So um, moving on, secure, security improvement projects. Um, Muter construction has all but wrap, wrap, wrapped up the new doors, the new walls, the office doors, doors are in, all, all, all the touch-ups up, and stuff are done, and in, NC Sound is com coming behind them. Uh, we have had some small issues with teachers fobs and stuff, but we have staff on site that's getting them into the new um, S2 system, hardware system, so kind of some delay there, but nothing major. Um, they are at 30, 35% and we have used or need, needed minimal contingency out of that project. Um, over, over, over at Clayton High School, we are underway with the field house construction. The five is existing buildings are gone and we have been in installing storm drain systems, water lines, sewer lines, and those guys are struggling with, with the rain. Um, I'm a little worried about, about, about their schedule right now, but we are meeting tomorrow to discuss um, increased forces, possibly some weekend work whenever they do have good, good weather. So, not not to fear I'm on on the case and we will get that that, that one for the uh, foot, football team come August so over at North North Johnson High School we are about to start the HVAC projects for the gym um, starting next week they will be re, running some refrigerant lines in in the lobby um, they do have the basketball schedule so there's not not going to be in, any impact there and then starting in march they will be tying in the new duct work mechanical system all of that after basketball is done so should not be be, be it and an issue we have a great company from wilson southern piping on on board and and they are well aware that graduation is the end of may North Johnson High School front entrance. We 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 just discussed that and um, looking forward forward to getting st started on that. As as you c can see, there is a sweet re rendering of, of of what that entrance will look like. Um, but most importantly, aside from appearance, um, we are providing hand handicap access to the front office. Um, 
paving, need, need some parking, um, and also storm water department. Water, it, it, it currently drains towards the school, and, and we are going to wedge some and drain drain it away from, from the school and add some catch, catch basins and stuff. Mr. And, Moore, yes. on, on that, I don't mean to cut you off, but um, obviously North Johnson High School needed a lot of work in the front part of the school, and I want to commend uh, the person who had the idea of taking down all the trees in the front of the school as far as security is a big it's a big win for not only the stu I mean just being able to see the schools is is much better but as far as security and safety of students in that school that was that was a big win and it really looks nice from the road now so that was a great job Mr. Moore, while we're asking questions here, um, I did receive a, a question from some stakeholders in the North Johnston community regarding the front doors of, of this re uh, rendering. Are we replacing those front doors? I know they're pretty old and they've been painted on uh, many, many times. We are not. No, sir. The, Thank you. The goal was to get get the project awarded within in the, the budget, and un, unfortunately, they didn't make the current cut. So, are they going to be facelift in this in this uh, with a new coat of paint and looking a part of the new uh, addition? Well, each each project we anticipate adds contingency and stuff. So we 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 built built in some. Funds, and I think that this this one we have thirty thousand in there. Um, let me get get the footings dug and out of the ground, so it said to speak, and we 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 make and add add some painting, possibly even some doors. So, um, and last but not least, this afternoon we held the pre bid conference for the new pre-K-5 elementary school that is slated for the Thanksgiving area. Um, we are receiving lots of attention on, on this. We had, I think, about 12 bid bidders there, and we've had some from Virginia Collis, Wilmington, Charlotte. So people like, like building our schools. Um, I will say that this school uh, base bid capacity is 886. And we have included an alternate as part of the build, bid to build six additional classrooms that, that would take that capacity to 1,007. Um, so hopefully with the um, with all the bid bidders that, that we get some good competitive numbers and get some good al alternate numbers and we can go, go ahead, ahead and now and build build the whole thing that's that's the goal but but budget prevails any questions for me no but <clears throat> thank you for all you're doing and um i sent a request to miss gill if you if you have any extra money laying around <laughs> 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 we in all seriousness we have a student uh, a handicapped student at south johnson high school that uh, as a freshman, she's taking PE and she's confined to a wheelchair. And it, when it rains, there's no cover. And the young lady is getting drenched each time it rains, trying to get into her gym class. So if we can, if there's any extra money, you find any extra money laying around, we need to put a cover, uh, cover that walkway so that uh, uh, since she is handicapped, we need that. I'll, I'll definitely check in in to to that because when when we started Corinth Holders High School, we we removed about 200, 260 feet of that canopy, and we put some at mi micro this summer, elementary, and I think there's about 80 feet left of it. So maybe that'll work out. Wonderful. You. If you'll get up with Mr. Weaver, we would really appreciate that. Thank you. Brooks, I have uh, a question, too. Uh, HVAC is what made me think about it. A couple of years back when we were meeting with the commissioners and asking for money, 
we had asked for money to replace, I think it was nine, 20 year or older, I don't know if it was boilers, chillers, combination, whatever, but um, we did not get the funds to do that. I know we've done some through the LGC money. I know we've done some through the bonds. How many are going to be left when this is all said and done that are still in that 20 year old or more category? Go back and take a look at our full sheet that we have that has all the ages on them. Um, but we did um, everything that we promised to do in the LGC, the 30 million we did, which was Cooper, Selma Middle, um, East Clayton. Um, and then we have identified uh, Benson, we've got a boiler at Cleveland, um, we've got some improvements both at South Johnston, several of those. So we, upon hearing that question earlier, we went back and looked to see out of those, then how many more do we have left, what's the ages of those. The good thing is, you know, you've got 22 or more that are model schools. So you take those off, then you start looking at Corinth, for example, we were able to put one in. Um, there, we've got North Johnston, we're doing some things too. So let us go back and get a report for you that's comprehensive to help you know the, the ages. But I do know that everything we committed to on both sides of this with money either is planned to be done or has already been done. Appreciate that. With, you know, every time we get a wave of cold weather and then we have the heat is not working in a particular school, obviously that's yeah, something that's a huge thing. Line. Mm -hmm. You read my mind because, um, and I don't want to belabor the, the point and the time, but it's important to note that, that Mr. Moore put up the first picture on that construction update is the mezzanine area of our new schools. And um, we, are, we have, with height, our design is a four-pipe system, too cold, too hot. And they have air handlers in our design. Is that high? You're actually proud of me. Good job. Um, <laughs> you have air handlers for every classroom. And what you're looking at in that picture is the four pipes coming across. And then you see those little silver things are all of the air handlers going to those classrooms. In a situation like Florida's Elementary, thank you, Billy Massingale, who taught me about this. That situation there, we're replacing an entire unit. We're still waiting for that unit that will be arriving from Mexico this week, I was told. It is designed, not any fault of our own, but it was designed to where that handler, air handler has to support just about the whole hallway. So you have one air handler that goes out in a model school, you can get that remedy. You have one that goes out here, you, you're dealing with a whole bigger issue, and that's why the timing. So that's a perfect example of, of the, the, the model design that we have within the USA and our, our collaborative relationship with how we design our schools here. And I guess the other question is, how many schools do we have left that are on the, is it the R22 refrigerant that, was oh, it 2025 that can use that no longer? That's, that's kind of what I was going to brief, briefly add is, your question is a very loaded question because we have 76 R22 chillers that in 2025, you can't even buy it anymore. If and they're not necessarily our old chillers, it's just. But, but the question with age, most, most schools have more than one chiller and one works primary, secondary. So age, age is a tough, a tough parameter to go off of because the secondary one can be much older because the primary one that carries most of the day-to-day -day, day load goes out first, and so. So the, R the R22 is gonna end up being our bigger problem probably sooner than later. And on those, we can continue to use it, but if it breaks down, you can't that's add right. the refrigerant. Is that, is that how that's gonna work? Um, through some very good planning, you know, we try to take some of our funds and buy what's available of that. Um, and then also recover it out of ones that we are repairing to keep. But that's, that's only going to take us more time. And this is an issue that's not just here in our county. When I work with the facilities folks in our CC RESA, this is a problem that's going to be everybody's dealing with this. Um, so we're going to have to begin to plan for that. So when we talk about a comprehensive look at HVAC for you, that issue as well as aid, as well as what we're covering, in um, both bond and our past LGC is going to need to take center stage soon.
2025 is going to be here quicker than we can imagine. That's something that we really, really need to make sure is on the county commissioner's radar because that's going to be a huge, huge thing for us. The facilities assessment that was done, I mean, years ago, two years ago? So the $30 million we borrowed was, was part of that assessment. What was the total amount of that assessment? Was it $100 million? Oh, it was well over that. $200 million. And, and that addressed all the HVAC systems that like need that to be replaced. Comments. Okay. Ms. Gill, um, what is the cost of one chiller? Is it four to 500000 Oh, definitely. Okay. But they're, they're diff, 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 different sizes. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. Okay. Average. So 76 chillers, and, you know, it's not a, the bond has to go to even years, so we're not having it in 2020. Uh, the next available time will be 22. Uh, because by the time you get to 24, it's going to be too close to 25 with 76 chillers. Um, and let's just say they're 500,000 apiece, um, rounded up to 80. That's, that's close to the amount of money that we got in this bond to build a school. Um, and we continue to grow at the capacity, we're grow, the, the pace we're growing. Um, we're going to need a lot more than $60 million just to take care of our chiller issue as well as our growth issue. Um, but with that being said, I would like to thank the county commissioners and the taxpayers, um, everybody in this room who voted for the bond, because without the bond, uh, we would not be in the position we're in today talking about these projects that are going on. So uh, thank you to everybody in Johnson County that voted for this bond, because as you can see, we we are using that money to uh, assist us in, in a lot of different areas. Um, we're still over capacity at Corinth Holders at High School. However, we've got other projects going on that are in need as well. So without that bond, we wouldn't be in, we wouldn't have these discussions tonight and we, I don't know where we'd be getting the money. So thank you to everybody who voted for that bond in 2018. All right, thank you. Um, the next item I have is Board Exhibit uh, 8C4, Print Shop Copiers. On March 20, 2020, the current copier equipment lease will expire with CEI. This equipment consists of two high-volume black and white copiers as well as one high-volume color copier. These machines are used on a daily basis for printing orders from around our district. Printing services uh, strives to continue to support quality services. The current yearly rate is $60,573.60 for the three copiers and a wide format printer. With the proposed new lease, the print shop will have a high volume black and white copier, a high volume color copier, and a wide format printer while gaining a laminating machine capable of laminating large print, which is a request for many of our, our they want poster size types of things and they want them to be able to do that and we have to outsource some, some of those particular things. Um, this was negotiated under a state contract vendor. It's recommended to award the contract for the print shop to CEI of Raleigh. The term rate for 48 months is 47000 dollars and 40 cents per year over the course of the term and all the machines and the services are figured in the figure it's a district savings of thirteen thousand five hundred seventy three twenty per year and a fifty four thousand two hundred ninety two dollar and eighty cent over the four year i will say that as each one of our departments was looking at where we could cut local dollars because this was coming to its end we we, we actively sought to to renegotiate and go back through a vendor to see if we could cut costs. So this is definitely a, a cost savings for our local budget. And I bring that to you for approval. All right, well, this is an action item for uh, CEI of Raleigh for $47,000.40. Is that correct, Ms. Gill? Yes. Um, and uh, it is a savings, per, yes, per year, with a savings of over $13,000 per year of our current uh, contract. So I would entertain a motion. I'll move. 
Motion by Ms. Grant, second by Mr. Johnson. Any questions or comments? Thank you for looking for savings. <laughs> I work with a tremendous team who's in there. They do a great job every day. All right. All right. No further questions. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. The next item that I have is Board Exhibit 8C5, and this is a bus, bus transportation presentation. Um, this is a very in-depth presentation that we gave to our principals just a couple of weeks ago um, about some ideas that we have been working with, um, with both Dr. Cosby, our transportation folks, as to how we can continue to um, better and efficiently uh, support the needs of our students while trying to save as much money as we possibly can. I will say to you that the items in this presentation are draft in that uh, anything you see related to bell schedules and things of that nature are not finished. These are proposals. These are things we're working with our principals on right now. So I'll go ahead and just kind of tell you what we're looking at here. Um, just, just to kind of break it down before we go into the presentation. If we can get a consistent bell schedule for elementaries, middle and highs, that's based on a certain period of time from start to finish. Now, that's bell to bell, um, but that's somewhat related to what Dr. Coates does with the use of instructional time. If we can do that, we can save on efficiency. We get money based on efficiency for our buses. We can pull some buses off the road, which means that's not an, as many people having to drive those buses. And with more coordinated schedules, instead of it taking sometimes four drivers to do um, a run for a bus, you can get that done with two. So this is um, one way, in addition to continuing to seek more full-time driver onlys. Um, and remember, you also worked as our, when I was on policy, to compress the timeline for getting folks licensed down, and we cut that by 30 days, that these um, multiple ways of looking at transportation will start to yield benefits over time. The other thing, remember, that we worked on was really looking at those midday runs. Where can we use contracted transportation to assist us? I think what we're going to ultimately determine is there is no one solution that is going to get us where we need to be, but we need to explore all solutions. So the, the one thing I kind of want to talk to you a little bit um, in this limited time is what's included in this presentation so you can go back and take a look at it. And I want to thank the transportation folks for putting that together. Michelle, would you be a help? She is so good to me. Um, this is transportation facts. I won't go through them all, but this helps you know what we are looking at on a daily basis, what's out there rolling, and who are the people doing that. The next slide, um, when you go into this link, I want to thank Sharon Fogelman, who recently retired. She put together a historical document that will tell you the history of why we went to multi-tier busing in the first place. What's the first region that we went to, how we added it on, and how it pulled buses off of the road. And I would encourage you that that is a fantastic document for us to go back and review history of why we were effective in the beginning with our busing and efficiency. Because remember, we get money every December based upon how efficient we are. That's the DPI model of how that's done. So. We love innovative programs, and we want to do those, but it's a balancing act. The more innovative programs you have, the more spread out your driving routes are, the more people you're putting on the roads and buses on the road, the less efficient you become, and you are dinged on whether or not you're efficient. And so any corrections that we made this year, let's say Choice Hub for one, that we're not transporting for that. Um, I won't see the benefit of that till next December. So, um, you know, you're thinking, well, Dak, we did all this. How come we're not seeing the benefits? Just the way that they do that with the money. So I just wanted to encourage you. That was the reason we did that, because when you run out of buses that we don't have sitting on the lots for sub and we're putting them out on the road, you are then having to start going into your local 
budget to purchase a bus at ninety-five to hundred thousand dollars, and we are about fourteen what they call credits. 14 credits short from that happening to us. And we grow by 500 students a year, easy. So you can see that we have got to make some adjustments in how we use time and our resources if we're gonna be able to not get in the business of buying buses and we just can't do that. So moving on ahead. Um, Ms. Gill, can, yeah. can you explain the credits? Yes, and I will explain it when I get a little further in there. It says credit for future buses. I've had to learn some of this, Ms. Grant. I really have. Um, and um, as we grow and add new buses, the state gives you credits for when they're going to give you a bus. And if you don't have any credits, you got to buy them out of your own money. And they don't send them to you. And um, so that's what we have been told over and over again. Y'all got to be careful. You're putting more and more buses out on the roads. So here are our transportation challenges. You know what they are. Um, and um, we could spend an hour talking about all of those. But one of the things that is happening is we've heard elementary TAs being pulled out too early. That is when the timing doesn't work out with the bell schedules because then, you know, your high school may run beautifully. But your middle school, there's people sitting on, now is it a huge number of people when we look at the data? No, but any one TA having to come out of any one kindergarten classroom is, is enough. And they're having to sit, in some cases, on a middle school lot for 15 to 20 minutes, what's called lag time. We're paying them. They're not in their classroom serving kids. And then what happens is the elementary school's waiting far down the line and they've already gotten out of school and their parents are running the car line and they're like, well, why aren't the buses going? We gotta tighten that up. And that's what this all comes down to. And um, we're, we're having to go principle by principle to say, how does this affect you? How are we gonna work through those things? Um, and then, so we talked about the lag time and then we've already talked about efficiency. Uh, medical exemptions continues to be an issue, um, and let me speak to medical exemptions. We are required to do a medical exemption process. Uh, Mr. Vetrano and myself and some transportation folks are actually going to NC State this week, and we're supposed to identify a certain number of, of folks that are exempt each year, and that's getting more and more difficult as large as we are. So we actually have a statistics class and professor, the head of statistics, who is going to take that problem. We're presenting it to her Thursday evening, and they are going to, thank you to Mr. Vetrano who thought of that idea, we are actually going to give them this problem, and they are going to study it the rest of the semester to help us come up with a formula for a deter that's, that's tested to be able to determine what is the appropriate number of people to exempt. Um, based on data. So we're very excited. Uh, she did tell me that the class, she was going to assign it to three students and that people were so nervous about it, they decided to do it as a complete class project. So we have a PowerPoint ready for them and we're excited to go to NC State Thursday. Uh, next one is, this is just for you to be able to see this concept of how many people it may be taking to do certain buses and we've given you some actual um, data about that. Uh, next, um, this is um, what we, why we want to do a draft bell schedule and all the reasons why I will say, one thing that we can do is we're finally large enough that we can do a North Johnston attendance area multi-tiered route for them as well. Um, and we have that as a possibility as well. Princeton Middle High is a little bit different. They're kind of in their own unique set. We have some Benson Middle, Benson Elementary, Four Oaks that's in their own little piece there. But the more that you can get on multi-tier routes, the better it's going to be for you. This is just our proposed times. Those times can really once we meet with the principals one-on-one, -on -one, we can really narrow those times down better for them. Um, moving forward, um, yeah. Um, we have it on pretty good authority that some of our schools are not meeting the seven-hour day. Mm -hmm. You cannot count lunch. You cannot count transition times yes. in your five yes. and a half hours of instruction. Yes. And 
if you could just address how that's being yes. addressed. So remember that all of our schools must have 1,025 hours. And um, when we choose to make up school or not make up school, it's based upon whether we've got enough banked hours. And so when you have fluctuations like this, um, it can, now remember mine's bell to bell, but that's not, I can't just say a perfect seven hour day. What we're doing to make sure this works is she's got a spreadsheet that she's working on that the principal will start to put in. Here's when my bell starts. Here's when my recess is. Here's when my transitions between the bells are, where my power lunch is, so that from the DPI standards of taking time in and out, they find out how much time they're actually in instruction and get more of a consistent look of that but on a middle school, high school, elementary look. And then that helps to make sure that we can get the start and end times. It could be, instead of a seven hour day, it could be a 6.55. I just have to make that work between when I come to school and when I leave and make sure we have consistent time because she's gonna be adding those hours up to make sure that everybody's gotten the 1,025. And what we've looked at this morning um, this, with adding instructional days to the calendar as a whole, um, getting more consistency, getting more towards seven, um, we are getting in much better shape as far as consistency with what kids are getting from one side of the county to the other with the instructional day. Because what does research tell us is the biggest thing? Time on task. Um, and so we have to pay attention to that. And then, so it's not just a financial thing, it's a consistency in what the experience that children are getting from one place to the other. Um, I th so Paula is helping me with that. So what I'm trying to, to, to get across this evening is we feel this is the best recommendation for our district moving forward. And we would like to bring this back to you in March to say this is the bell schedule that we proposed based upon the consistent instructional day and working with our principals. So that's a thank you for bringing that up. Um, and then moving on through, I've given you some of the thoughts, pros and cons document. We'll open that up for just a minute. I love this one. Transportation came up with this, but this will give you all the reasons why this is a good idea and if there's any reasons why it is not a good idea. About the only reason it's not a good idea is it gives a school less flexibility. But there are some things to consider now that you are the seventh largest out of 115 LEAs, that in some degree you have to have some consistency and there's a balancing act between site-based and what you gotta have to be fiscally responsible and being able to make this work in a large, basically mega district. Um, back in up. Um, we're almost to the end. So what are our next steps? We need to continue to work with our individual principals to make refinements so that we make sure their input is important. We can't just arbitrarily put something out without helping them understand what they may or may not have told us. In some instances, not intentionally, they may have said that their start time was five minutes sooner or later, but it's not on our spreadsheet when we got ready to route buses. Five minutes can just make the world of difference in how things are transported. So if there's miscommunication between that, that can cause a kink to be in the system. So we would like to be able to bring a bell schedule to you in March. That's why we're giving you this information today uh, so that we can start routing the buses and begin to promote for our parents. These adjustments are not huge adjustments. There's, they're five, 10 minutes, and if they're more than that, we're certainly gonna talk with those principals. Uh, 15 minutes is, is probably the threshold of change that I think we'd feel comfortable with before it gets to be too much of a change for a particular school. But we're gonna look at it piece by piece. Um, so we're excited to bring it to you. I know you've had to sit for a long time, but we hope that this is helpful. Questions? I, I have a comment. Okay. <laughs> uh, this was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, the, you know, the financial benefits are good, but the thing I love the most in this is the 75 more minutes of instruction each week for these TAs, um, you know, that's one of the, gosh, probably one of the most common complaints that I hear, I assume the rest of you, is being the TAs being pulled out of the classroom too early. 
-hmm. and um, and we need them in the classroom. I wish they didn't have to leave the classroom at all. Right. Uh, you know, we tried to do some things to make that happen. It didn't work, but this is a good way to we're doing, help. It's it's going to be a methodical, continuing process, and we're also we're in a perfect storm situation. We're not a district that is that is static. When you grow at the the extent that we do, you're putting buses on the road for growth all the time, not even just for new programs. So it's it's an in depth issue, one that I think is multi layered. But we've got to be able to say that we're doing everything we possibly can to do a better job. Uh, we also uh, hear complaints about how come my kid goes to school for this many hours and if they went to this school over here, they'd only be going this many hours. And, um, you know, I, I asked years ago about why don't we have uniform start and stop times and, you know, I don't remember what the answer was, but obviously we can do it, and obviously there's benefits to doing it. So thank you so much for You're you guys looking at this. You're welcome, and just a tremendous amount. Of, and we have to have the support of our principals, and they're so important in this. They're the ones doing it every day. So we just need these extra few weeks before March to make that happen with them. Thank you. Question. Well, and I want to thank you. I, I know this is a tremendous amount of work and time. Um, and even though it may only be five or ten minutes, change is change. <laughs> even when it's good change, it's hard. So uh, I appreciate your, your efforts. And I see this as another step forward in helping us. Um, you know, the policy committee, uh, a year ago we said, you know, we need a plan so that we can eventually stop requiring our classified personnel to drive buses. And so this is this is just another step in that right direction. Mm -hmm. um, and I, kn I know, Mr. Vetrano, you all have been working hard to find full-time drivers. So um, kudos to both of you. Knock, knock. That was my question, too. We had a bus driver fair how, how did that go, and what were our benefits? Well, our spring one has gone much better, but we tried to do a December one, and that did not go well. We only had five that particular day. But again, remember, that was the week that Wake County said they were upping their pay for their drivers. So I'm not sure that we, we got a whole lot of benefit from that. Yes, yes. But we do, we do still have a good, good turnout um, for our spring, so we'll continue to do that. Do we recruit at the community college at all? I don't think we are at this particular time, but we certainly can consider that. We're, we're open to any options. The reason I ask, we have a neighbor with a babysitter who goes to JCC. Her classes are in the afternoon. Um, and she has said, you know, if I'd known about this, I would have applied, and now she's gotten another job. But that would have been an ideal job. They can take classes in the middle of the day, take classes at night, and drive full time. And, and have a pretty decent income. I mean, it's not, not gonna get rich, but they'll support their family. And also want to say that a lot of our classified employees have to drive buses to make ends meet. Single moms want those routes. So I don't want us to ever get to the point where we say, well, I can't, if you're a TA, you can't drive a bus, right. because they need that fund, they need those funds to, to survive. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Ms. Wacker, sir, can you back up to the draft bail schedule, please, that particular slide. And just going back to what the equity piece was a little while ago, you know, the transiency of school leadership. Certainly we want to be sure our principals in our high schools and middle schools have a tremendous amount of input in the start time. And just looking at different aspects, I would actually like to have type responses or type thoughts from them so we can look over it as a board of education on how they feel about changing this. Because if you go earlier than 730, I mean, you're looking at lighting issues, safety issues. I mean, this is Johnston County. And like you said, there's a tremendous amount of growth. So we have more densely populated areas. We have a lot more people in a smaller area in some areas, and also we have rural areas. So I don't want to present a traffic hazard or safety concern, which is also a part of the strategic plan we were also looking at earlier was the safety of our students and also the community involvement. So if the board would grant me that, I would like to have some type responses from the principals on what they feel 
about the start time and changing that start time because I agree consistency is a huge part of success. However, you know, I want their input to be extremely valuable if we're going to make this decision because they're the ones involved in the implementation and I would like to hear it directly from them. I appreciate you. So, and I also think if we, we linked it on here, the 1920 bell schedule and the 2021, and I think that the earliest time, you know, we're not looking to bump it up any earlier for the high schools. I think it's a little bit later, I think. Yeah, because I think right now in some schools it might be 710. I think that would go to 715. Um, but you're right, and you, you do have to look at that. And then, you know, you've also got to consider if you went 730 in a high school with a multi-tiered route, it could put your high school, I, I can't speak, it will get your elementary folks could be coming into school approaching the 9 o'clock hour in a multi-tiered route. So we, we did this exact same presentation with the principals and, and hope they went back and studied it and talked with their teams about it too because that history of, of the multi-tiered routes is really important as to how school A affects school B and regions upon regions, you know, especially when you get out in Clayton area um, that's so expansive. Everybody relies on each other. In some cases, you've got uh, TAs who get called to sub on a bus from West Clayton, but they might be told to go over to Riverwood. And so all, all of it kind of ties together. These are great points. We can certainly do a Google survey where people put in um, their actual um, thoughts about if, if they say, yes, it'll work for me, then why won't it work? It, it, here's why it will work. If it won't work for me, then why? And we need that from both sides because I need to be able to call that principal up. Right now, they're just emailing me. I need to be able to call that principal and say, talk me through this and what would happen if we did this. So that helps us make better decisions. That's why you're right. I need more time in these next three weeks to really get to that part of it. Well, and, and also not just looking at the start time, but the end time with the multi-tiered. Yeah. Uh, you would have, uh, you could, uh, right now we have elementary students who are getting home at 5 and 5.30. So if you push it down too far, you'd have elementary kids getting home at 6 or 6.30. So, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a complex issue and one in which you, you, you can't take it lightly, but everybody has to have input on it at the same time. Well, and I think that history is so valuable because I'm old and I remember when we started that. Mm -hmm. and, and it really was about saving money because we were going into the recession mm -hmm. and we didn't have the dollars to continue to purchase new buses. Um, and it, it, it really, um, we were able, I can't remember exactly how many, I'll have to read the history on it, but we were able to save gobs of money uh, because we didn't have to purchase those buses and um, you know so it, it, and then you look at the efficiency um, how much money are we getting now with our efficiency rating I would have to take and look I can't remember that but we used to be at a hundred percent efficiency so even going down a percent our efficiency is still excellent even with the challenges, but even going down a, a percentage or two uh, in our situation is going to be expansive. So let me let me look that up for you, and get the right numbers for you to see over time what's happened. And just glancing, like you said, at the schedule for this year, it looks like middle schools probably be least affected. It looks like eight oh five is what they are already doing. Yeah, they're the ones that shot back about the email five minutes early. later. Uh, about five right. minutes later on your high schools. <laughs> yes. So, so we're, uh, were you it looks like about five minutes later on high school and maybe about 10 minutes earlier on and you got elementary. And you've got so a couple of pockets in there where, the, where inadvertently a principal change, it may not be the principal that's sitting there, may have changed a time. It's showing up on the website, one thing. It's on the bell schedule we routed from back in August and another, and it's creating a bit of an issue. And nobody knows, nobody's doing it purposefully. It's just happening. So on your proposed 2021 bell schedule, you have a couple of um, schools in different colors, blue, green, and, mm -hmm. and I guess it's a peach color. Mm -hmm. 
there's no like specific index as to what those colors indicate. I'm sure they mean something that might help us with yeah. looking at what the that two. means is Princeton, the Princeton area is their own little transportation unit, and the same with Benson and Four Oaks. Thank and you. then when you get down here to the green, that's where we're proposing to go with a multi tiered test system in the green. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. I should have put you a key there, but ran out of time. Now we'll go to the adjustment to the agenda that Ms. Zukowski brought up, the attendance boundaries. Mm -hmm. Do you want me just to start speaking to it? Okay. All right. So the first key to what I think is going to help us with our answers is um, I was on the phone with um, ORED um, this week and um, we're going to have a face-to-face -face meeting with them about the results of the limited land use study and the only reason it says limited is because we didn't sit down with them he did phone calls with them that's planning directors that's mayors anybody that would talk to them about future development so when you do those land use studies you need to have a joint meeting with your commissioners and you all and we're going to need to get that done in the next month to month and a half so that's coming um, and so that's the key with looking at out of capacity, what's the future of growth looking like, um, and then looking at what our numbers and where they exist at each school today that helps us begin to say, this is where we're having issues. Um, we know that we're getting ready to have to identify boundaries at Lynch Road, um, and that's coming really soon. And so we're going to have to have uh, probably some work sessions with you all to help you understand what goes into that. Now that we've gotten through, you know, we're working through the land, the sewer, school design, we're now going to the next set of things. Um, so bear in mind that when we do that boundary, it could create from an elementary perspective a domino all the way up to getting into to some of Clayton. I don't want you to quote me on that, but you understand that when you're, when you're taking a large chunk from one school to put to the new school, you can have what they call the ripple effect. So we're going to have to get educated with what their recommendations are. And then through um, the community engagement meeting process, we're going to have to deal with that. And you have to give plenty of people plenty of time to decide where those boundaries are going to be, right down to which road's included, which isn't. Here's the good news. The gentleman that has worked for us, um, that does our work with ORED, um, has been with us over 20 years. He has all the historical data about how prior boards have done attendance boundaries. And remember, and y'all are wanting to keep a neighborhood, this has been our, our feel in Johnston County, the neighborhood schools concept. So he's fully aware of that's gonna be the conversation that we're gonna be sitting down and going through. So land use study, We've got to sit down um, and go through some work sessions with you on the attendance boundaries related to Lynch. Okay, In that same conversation, we can talk about other pockets of areas. And the pocket that you're speaking of is the Riverwood, Clayton Middle piece. Um, and um, he can give us some of the factors related to that. What would that look like? Um, I've asked transportation to go ahead and pull me some um, of the early numbers related to that. Um, and then the decisions would need to be made from this board as to how much can you handle in one year. And that is something to consider. I would just put out to you that, you know, you have a superintendent search coming up. You definitely are going to be handling the Lynch Road um, assignments and boundaries. And um, at the same time, um, trying to open a new school year. So all things can be done, but we just have to pace the change in order to be able to make it manageable. Do we see some needs in those certain pockets? We do. Do we have the right folks who will be around the table in the next few weeks to help us identify and propose solutions? We absolutely will as well. Um, but I want us to go through that first step of the land use first. I will say that in a meeting I was with, in with the commissioners related to our sewer, um, they remember this meeting and they said, is it time for one of those meetings again? I said, it is. And um, 
I actually talked to ORED because they're interested in that meeting to have a less formalized feel to it. They would like to be able to have the documents about the land use soon along with you guys and then be able to have an exchange of information about growth over time. And I think that's a productive way of looking at it. And I, um, I was very encouraged that ORED felt the same way, that it needs to be um, everybody already having the base information. That's why those work sessions with you guys are important. Them having that survey and all the tables and then be able to come in instead of seeing it for the first time, that we're all having good communication about where you all see growth, what their perspective is on growth, because that translates into capital needs and future bonds. Um, did I answer your question to a degree? So I, my main focus is making sure that we don't have 45 kids in a classroom, mm -hmm. yes. you know, and the transition at Riverwood Middle mm -hmm. with all the students in the hallways at the same time is is a bit much. Right. Um, we've had teachers come and present to the board. I'm yes. sure every member on the school board has probably heard Mm -hmm. heard the complaints about that and and I understand that it's going to have a ripple effect but I think that it's we have got to address that situation and right. that issue. So one of the things that if we decide we want to proceed after these preliminary steps which aren't going to take huge huge amounts of time to get in a position to to identify what we've got you would certainly they can help us do that uh, that would mean um, you know contracting with them for an additional scope of work to work on adjusting the lines um, with them um, and we can certainly look at that and do that we just I want you to know all of you collectively what that process looks like what that timeline looks like whether or not you want to run two attendance boundary timelines with engagement meetings and things like that in and what period of time you want to do that in. Do you want to get one group ready and then start with the next group? But you need to know what's your priorities, whether it's, you know, we know we've got to do lunch, and then is that going to be our next priority, and how would we go about doing that? Well, and just to piggyback on Tracy's thing, I mean, Lynch is elementary. I understand you're talking about some ripple effects, but you know, we just opened the middle school just a couple of years ago. The next school that we get, we hope, will be a high school. So it's going to be a while before we're thinking about another middle school. Mm -hmm. We already know we're over capacity at one, and I understand under capacity at the other. Right. And so yeah. and it, I mean, it's, it's going to be a while before... That's right. It's a logical thing that we're going to have to take some steps in looking at. Because Archer's Lodge, you know, by the end of the bond, we, we've got a 12 to 18 classroom addition because they're in overload status right now. Um, and then you've got um, Riverwood. We know the situation that, that it's in. So we're, we're, what I really need to do is, is get them to show me where the current lines exist, what adjustments and what kids that would affect. And we certainly want to make sure we do all of our research to know what goes into those conversations because if, if you've been in those engagement meetings where parents come in and talk about where they want to move and the grandfathering process and all that, it, it can be it can be tedious and it's it's a big change. So we want to make sure that we are um, approaching that change in a manageable format relation to, to Lynch because we find ourselves in that situation that's coming up quickly. We're, we're about 15 months out from opening that school. It's still a good problem to have. It's fun, isn't it? I hope I answered your questions. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Gill. Mm -hmm. At this time, we're going to take a five-minute break.
I will start again, go back into open session. Thank you. Good evening again. Mr. Stanley and I just have two items for you this evening, both informational items. The first is our ongoing update on current expense, state, federal, and capital outlay budgets in your packets. You should have this information. The first in, in your packet, the larger document, is the current expense. Behind that, you should have your state and then federal and then capital outlay budgets. And this information, again, has been updated from last month and is for your information. And Mr. Stanley is here to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions on the uh, information as far as our budget goes on any of the categories? First of all, I'd like to thank you for pulling all of this information together. I, I know it's a, a, an extra several steps, but I appreciate your, your diligence in getting this information to us each month. I appreciate it as well. I know that the uh, Finance Committee has asked for this, and it'll be on a monthly basis, and it's what bankers like to see, sources and uses of cash each and every month, and we'll get this monthly. Uh, as well as the commissioners, so everybody be on the same page. Um, but I appreciate uh, Dr. Williams and Mr. Vetrano and Art and the finance department putting this together because this is this is not an easy work to put together. But once we got the the template, uh, we can just key in the numbers and keep everybody updated. I, I appreciate the finance committee moving in this direction as well and. Like we've said many times tonight, good stewards of our money. We need to know where it's going, and, and I commend you guys on that. And uh, thank you, Brian and, your, and, and Art and everybody for putting this together so we can see and make sure that, you know, we continue to stay within the budget that, that uh, we have uh, strived to get to as far as the, what the assistance of the county commissioners on their behalf as well. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, it may not be you that can answer it. It may be Ms. Gill. Oh, okay. Because of something she emailed out today. So the ELA curriculum, um, we were all under the impression uh, when we presented to the county commissioners that the curriculum was going to be $1.5 million and that was going to come out of fund balance. We didn't know until we received your email today that it was going to be made in payments over two years, and the first year was paid for by state-appropriated monies. So what is the total cost? Is the second year coming from state monies or local monies? We purchased two different curriculums, even though all of it was English language arts. The K-5 English language arts curriculum was purchased from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, and it included the English version of that curriculum and the Spanish version for the schools that are in du the dual language program. There's three of those elementary schools, so they had the exact same curriculum in English and Spanish. In addition to that, at that time, we are required, you heard the discussion about the MTSS instructional model, we're required to have an evidence-based intervention program. So we were able to purchase the math intervention program that was do the math, and we, did, we looked at a lot of them. This one was the best one, and because we were already purchasing the English language arts curriculum, they allowed us to pay for that over a three-year period because of our budget situation. So that was part of the Hooten Mifflin Harcourt invoice. 
the 612 English language arts curriculum was my perspectives. That's for middle and high school. For each of those companies, it was negotiated, and that was Pearson. It was negotiated because of our budget situation that we would pay for those curriculums over time. So we have a contract that if you'll pull, I don't remember the month, but I can find it. When we approved the contracts for curriculum instruction accountability, the Hoot Mifflin contract was on there, and it has on there over a two-year period. The same thing with the Pearson uh, curriculum. I have the rough draft numbers. What I'm checking right now before I share it out is does this include shipping, handling, tax, and those kinds of things. So the curriculum purchase for the elementary, just the English part, was a little over uh, $2 million over two years. The same thing for the secondary was over $2 million for two years. So the total amount uh, depends on which year of payment you're looking at because the do the math um, the do the math curriculum staggers each year. The first year is one amount, the next year is more, and then the third year, that's the only expense out of that. And it's, it's not that high on the expense scale. I can tell you tonight the draft numbers that I think before I check for, um, ch see if that included textbooks. Um, excuse me, it did include textbooks to see if it included taxes and or shipping for those materials, but I don't want to put that out in public until I know the exact amount. I do have the exact amount of the invoice. So so all of that together was, was the curriculum purchase. Okay. okay. And yes. first year was out of state The funds. first year for K-5, I have checked. That was requested earlier in a public record request, and I did verify that was paid out of state funds. I would have to go check don't know about the, the, middle, rest. the secondary. I don't want to answer okay. without knowing for sure. Thank you. Our state, and the way we do that, some of our, our state funds that we can use, of course, are textbook funds. That doesn't cover the entire cost. We can also use the percentage of academically intellectually gifted funds that corresponds to the percentage of students. We have about 10% of our population that's identified that way. They require a core curriculum. So 10% of it could be paid from that and, and a small portion also out of our at-risk funding. Thank you for getting this together for us. You're welcome. Did I answer all those questions about that? The second item that we have, also an information item, was mentioned earlier in a policy revision uh, regarding the wellness audit. If you recall in January at the board meeting, it was approved that we would conduct a wellness audit. audit. Uh, since that time, we have been researching organizations that conduct such audits, and we have a meeting scheduled later this week with school efficiency consultants to discuss with them the work that they do. Uh, they are well respected in the state of North Carolina, uh, have been highly recommended uh, to our school system. And in fact, on, our, on their website, you can see that they have experience in conducting wellness audits. And they bullet out some of the uh, things that they look for in a wellness audit. So we look forward to our conversation with them later this week and just wanted to provide you with an update as to where we are on that subject. I get I guess the question <clears throat> Mr. Vitrano is when you we meet who's meeting with them do you know? I believe it's it's uh, Dr. Williams uh, the <laughs> finance committee is definitely welcome to be in that meeting. I would just ask you know as far as going through the process what they recommend as they do the wellness audit is it recommended that they do it over a certain amount of years? Or I'd like that information. So I'll probably be there, but can I ask this question? I just want to add that um, I did some research on SEC or School Efficiency Consultants as well. Uh, Hank Hurd is, is very well known across the state, if not the United States. He's former Associate State Superintendent for Financial and Business Services and CFO at the NCDPI. Um, and then you have Kathy Eisenhower, who was Associate Superintendent for Hickory Public Schools. Um, she has expertise in man maintenance, food service, purchasing, capital improvements, long-range planning, and transportation. And then Ricky Lopez, uh, a lot of us have met him at some of the meetings across the state, at the uh, School Board Association. He was the Associate Superintendent for Business Operations in Cumberland County. And uh, he's often called upon for presentations on school finance. Then I did some other 
you know, they have a lot of client testimonials on there. 30 districts in the state of North Carolina have utilized their services over the past, uh, you know, years. And um, our uh, Dr. Williams also reached out today to one of the counties and, and got some information from them as well. So I'll let him share that as well. Oh, yeah. So just uh, it, it just echoes, confirms what you've said is that uh, it was highly recommended. They had an uh, outstanding experience. And I think the quote was uh, two thumbs up that it was a uh, um, you know, very, very professional experience uh, and would recommend them to anyone. And, and many of the items, Mr. Chairman, that we've discussed this evening, um, ex exceptional children's services, transportation, school nutrition, they have experience in looking at all of those areas and more in order to provide the school system with useful information that we can utilize moving forward financially. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Crystal Roberts. Good evening. We have two items for you to consider, and then we'll provide you with our uh, equity update. Um, this metro wide area network service renewal is usually a consent item once we go into contract, but because of the, the amount um, and the fact that we still get a reimbursement, we get a reimbursement of 70%, but because of the amount, we wanted to bring it forth and be transparent so that you could see what we do with um, our wide area network and our E-rate services. We receive 70% of the $795,000 back, and then through the state, we receive the uh, additional, the remaining 30% back. So this is not, this is money that we spend, but we get it back, so. Uh, and this is not new to the board, but we just wanted to bring it forth to you. Any questions? Okay. And I'll ask Dr. Allen to come to the podium so that she can give you a brief uh, update on the co-located school-based mental health partnerships. Dr. Allen. Good evening, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here with all of you. Um, so I wanted to come with an update, but also seeking approval to move forward in the direction that we've chosen to date. As I shared with you back in December, we were seeking to start providing school-based mental health supports for our schools, not in lieu of anything that we currently provide, but to offer a service that isn't provided in all of our communities and is sometimes extremely difficult for our families to access on their own. Since then, we put together, we put the RFP, the request for proposals, out to the community, and we received applications in by our deadline of January 29th. We then came together as a vetting committee of 10 professionals, ranging from a school administrator, school psychologist, various other positions that all had uh, some serious thoughts on this matter, and we were able to come to the conclusion that we wanted to move forward with the support of two agencies. And after investigating what other districts have done and done successfully, we'd like for our first schools, we'd like to integrate in four schools first, and then that would begin in March. And then in August, we'd like to start our next wave of four schools. And I'm going to keep really close tabs on the first four in March to see how long it takes us to get a really good process going so that we can come up with a timeline as we move forward after August. After we decided who our two agencies were that one based on rubrics that we assessed their applications, we reached back out to school administrators to determine where the mental health needs are based on their observations and where their level of readiness is right now because March is a, a tricky deadline and we definitely wanted to make sure that we had uh, very intentional placement. So based on all that information, I would like for us to consider moving forward with the four schools being South Johnston High School, West Smithfield Elementary School, Cleveland Middle School, Archer Lodge Middle School, and because they're not technically a school but they need some significant support, I would like to throw in Choice Plus. 
And I would like for the two agencies with whom we partner to be Easter Seals and Hope Services because they both received the highest marks out of all the applicants we, re we received. And Easter Seals already provides co-located services in Durham Public Schools, so they have a lot to offer in terms of their expertise and experience. And Hope Services has recently become an established partner in our community with their day treatment facility. And then I'd also like to throw out there that because we want to continue to grow this initiative that I would also like for us to open the RFP process back towards the end of this school year so that we can consider if we need additional agencies to partner with in the fall, assuming this is approved. All right, this is an action item. Um, to move forward with Easter Seals and Hope Services with uh, South Johnston High School, uh, West Smithfield, Cleveland Middle School, Archer Lodge Middle, as well as Choice Plus. So I'll entertain a motion. Motion by Mr. Johnson, second by Mr. Wooten. Any questions or comments? Uh, will these providers be doing um, Medicaid billing and uh, that th they will handle that. This is not something that we will have to do. Correct. This is a separate billing process that they'll do independently. And we made sure that the providers that we accepted could accept Medicaid as well as at least two private insurances while seeking other private insurance companies for partnership. This is similar to the health care initiative at Smithfield Selma High School, only this is mental health? Is that the same kind of model? That's correct. Triple S started their initiative with a community agency about two to three years ago, and they did that independently, which uh, I commend them for their efforts, and they've made some great strides in those efforts. This initiative is going to be much more uh, stringently we're gonna have very significant protocols and procedures because we want it to have the utmost success and it won't just be with one school. So our next action steps, now that it has formally been approved, will be to meet with our vetting committee along with our agencies, along with those four schools, to come up with a referral process that's gonna work for all parties who are at the table. And then we're gonna take that model and continue to implement it as we start next school year. Start back, rather. I want to thank you. Um, many times children don't receive the mental health treatment that they need because it's not available. Um, and the adults in their lives don't always get them where they need to be. So thank you for making this effort. You're very welcome. What, right. Does anybody have any other questions? Any other questions before we vote? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Go ahead, Dr. Allen. Sorry. <laughs> I got really excited about this. <laughs> the, I wanted, while I'm up here talking about mental health, I wanted to also mention, per general statute, it's important for you to know how many mental health-related school personnel that we have in our district. And you have those numbers in front of you, and I just wanted to point out that you have them. And when you're looking at them, the position, the letters next to it, CY is for the current year and PY is for the previous year. So if you have any questions about any of those, you're always welcome to reach out. And that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Allen. Thank you. So Ms. Edmondson and I will now provide you with our quarterly update of our goings on in equity. And I'd like to start by just um, sharing with you that our department is committed to facilitating the crucial conversation around equity and its many layers. So to put it more simply, we're obligated, along with each of our Johnston County Public Schools coworkers, to do our part to level the playing field so that all students, regardless of socioeconomic status, race, gender, and every other unique characteristic they possess, is prepared to lead a successful life. So in addition to showing our work tonight, we'd like to offer you this takeaway, Equ equity and equality 
are two different terms that should not be used interchangeably. Equity means that students get what they need to be successful. Equality means everyone gets the same access to the same opportunities. We're journeying towards equity here in Johnston County Public Schools. That commitment requires us to address and acknowledge poverty and social, socioeconomic status. It requires us to remove barriers to learning and increase student access to the resources they need to become constructive and successful global citizens. And it requires us to study data and use that information to make decisions that will remove barriers that even we ourselves may be creating. In order to meet those objectives, we are meeting with our principals as we shared with you earlier to discuss their strategies and provide support for developing best practices. We're facilitating professional development sessions throughout the district. We're collaborating and sharing with our peers in the equity arena. And we're gathering information for, from those who are in the trenches to create a working environment that fosters success for all. So tonight, you'll also get an update and hear from a principal, someone who's in the trenches, to tell you about the equity work that she's doing in her schools. So Ms. Edmondson, and I will do the clicker, and we'll start. Well, it's a wonderful night. I'm glad everyone's still smiling and uh, upbeat. Our equity journey, our mission remains, as we've stated earlier, to achieve equity with a focus on fairness, impartiality, and justice. Our vision, an equitable environment in education where stakeholders can depend on leveling the playing field. Our ultimate goal to increase student achievement in a safe environment that values equity and where caring adults believe that all students can succeed by developing effective strategies for overcoming biases. Continuing our equity journey, we have the monthly equity meetings with our equity team. And what we do in those meetings, we uh, collaborate about what we're gonna present for the principals and then we try to make sure that we're providing engaging equity modules for the JCPS le leadership. For our, we also do equity presentations for select staff and we provide an overview about equity and we've done quite a few of them. The privilege walk or talk, we've done that quite a bit, still getting great opportunities to do that. Uh, and the, what we do with that, we provide opportunities for participants to experience the advantages and disadvantages of privileges. We have also worked with um, presentation with the Smithfield Town Manager and Department Leaders, and we're collaborating about equity. For CC uh, RISA, the Equity Advisory Council, we have the round table that I'm attending, and we're also informing and supporting other districts and we're looking at putting on a something, uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's going to be like in June or July, where we would actually have it in the Rocky Mount area, but so the other school systems that still are working on some strategies, we would invite people in to be able to participate in that, and that's in the work process we're working on that. School visits with school leadership, we're providing support and collaboration. Presentations per request provide sessions that focus on understanding and, and leveling the playing field through equity. And then the roadmap of e equity, that is our reference document. We're gonna take you on a little tour. This is as our JCPS equity journey continues. Corinth Total High School Equity Club, and they were participating in the privilege walk. These are the discussions during the uh, privilege walk. We have the uh, equity group that's located on the uh, left-hand side, and then it shows that a couple of days after they had that meeting, then 
the next, they came back together and they had even more wanting to be a part of it. We've done an equity session with our student advocates. Equity session with Classified Advisory Council. K-12 Principles PD, Understanding Differences. And you'll notice they're collaborating. And even with the, I'll tell you one of the things, when they had the computers up, um, we were talking about, as we dealt with understanding differences, we were um, discussing the ALG um, BTQ plus uh, information, some things, and so they were looking at the meanings of that. We also had the principals panel, where the principals were given questions, and we chose uh, four of them, and you see Mrs. Rosado, Mr. Bennett, uh, Mrs. Kelly Johnson and Mr. Brian Johnson. And they answered the particular questions that were asked and their colleagues had a chance to uh, listen to their responses. This is our work with the town of Smithfield. Our equity committee members. At this time, we're going to ask one of our wonderful principals from Johnston County Public Schools, Ms. Ro Melissa, Marissa Rosata, to come up and speak with us. And she is the principal at Selma Elementary. Um, good evening, um, Dr. Williams, board members. It's a pleasure for me to be here tonight. And how can I help? I know you have some questions uh, to ask, so I'm here to answer. So I was asked, how do I infuse equity um, in our school? And uh, I think that my recommendations or my strategies are just very simple. In order to diversify our staff, uh, I'm a dual language school, so Half of my teachers are come from Latin America or Europe, Spain, Spanish uh, speakers. And the other half are just folks from uh, either Johnston County Schools or it, there was a limited amount of African-American um, staff members. We are at 61% Hispanic and um, 20, uh, I'm gonna say 24% African-American, the rest is multi and and white, seven percent white. Um, so one of the things that I do, I just look at my staff. I look at who I, who do I have in the building, who can I grow, who may have potential. So one of the things that we've done, we've been very intentional, is just uh, looking into our own folks uh, at the school level and trying to get them into uh, going into teaching, being supportive, growing them. Um, another strategy that um, we have used has just been very intentional when we go to the job fair. We uh, try to be a little bit aggressive, and if we see candidates that uh, may fit our school, um, trying to just tell them how great our school is and what are some of the unique things that we do at Stelm Elementary um, to... Uh, make it a really good work environment. Our turnover is not really high. I'm very proud of that. I think that also comes from the previous principle. The uh, turnover is not really a high turnover. So uh, people like it, they stay there. So but that said, uh, that supports uh, just having teachers who look like our kids. And there's a strong body of research that supports that. And um, another strategy that I use is uh, the interview uh, process. Um, I feel that um, we feel that it's a best practice to have these panels to interview folks, uh, candidates. Uh, but panels sometimes could be intimidated. So I always believe in the second interview. Sometimes we just get together. We come up, we discuss. 
And uh, sometimes just having a smaller setting, we call that person back for a more intimate, if you want to say, uh, interview, and get to know their story. Uh, I just know that at my school uh, currently, and I spoke to that person today because she's very inspiring to me, um, a lot of entry teacher, um, did an interview great. But when we sat down and I heard her story, I said, oh my God, uh, this person needs to work here. So going beyond the credentials, uh, the credentials are important. We need the best teachers. But um, when you're trying to meet those other needs, uh, it's important to look at their story. And she had a tremendous story. And it was out of the context of education. It was from her previous job. So I just said, this person is someone we could grow and someone we, we should hire. And she's been very successful. When people come visit, I always tell take folks to her classroom to watch her, what she does. Uh, she has a classroom, and I call her classroom a unit. It's just a community. Uh, so uh, kids are happy. They're learning. So um, that's um, another strategy that I use. And the last one, if I may say, um, is uh, we are, I'm very proud to say, I just need to say that we are nominated as a showcase, national showcase school for capturing kids' hearts. So that was really, that makes me very proud. So implementing that process helps us also bring equity because it brings a process in which everyone uh, is treated the same, everyone's treated with dignity, with respect, it embeds building relationships. So I, I know we're all tired, so I, um, so as a school leader, that's how I infuse um, equity in terms of hiring and providing opportunities at the school level for our kids. Uh, we also have looked into the curriculum. We feel the new curriculum has uh, a lot of opportunities to bring um, culture awareness uh, and going beyond awareness, going uh, Learning, learning about culture and how to uh, bring that into uh, the classroom. And uh, why is it important to level the playing field? I think I already answered that. It's important because it's what's best for the kids. It'll help them uh, see people who look like them be successful. Know that we're on their side. I don't have a complicated answer. It's just really is what's best for them. It's research-based. It's proven. It works, and I think that at my school, based on the environment and the climate that we have now, to me, is living proof that it works if you diversify and kids are exposed to different people from different cultures. Uh, one last thing, I think that in our feeder pattern, we were very hard, uh, I'm gonna say three years back, and I have to give the, Mr. Allen a triple S kudos for his vision of bringing mental health support into the school system uh, before it, I mean, I'm sure it was a thought, but he actually came to action. I was honored to be an assistant principal there when this was all happening. And I said, when I have a school, I'm gonna do the same. What a great idea to bring a mental health uh, provider into the building just to provide equity of access to those services to our students. So um, when I became principal, I just send me everything you've done, have all your research, um, your process. So we started last year, mid-year, we, but we started it and this year we're also working together with the middle school with Mr. Baker. So I think that uh, we have great processes in place, and it's working, and again, it's another way we see the benefits of using these tools to level the playing field, and I don't know if that answers. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, thank, thank you for listening. I think, in summary, what Ms. Rosado has said is it's, it's just merely the right thing to do, and so we thank you for this opportunity. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah, I just got one comment from Ms. Rosado. Brief, okay. you know, when 
I teach about diversity in the workplace and my business classes, I always talk about how you get the best employees because you want the best employees regardless of their ethnicity, race, et cetera. But how you get the best of all kinds is you obtain a competitive advantage and you do that through money, morale, and efficiency. And unfortunately, we can't compete with some districts in money, but I want to give credit to you, Ms. Rosado. You definitely have the efficiency and you have the morale at Selma Elementary School. So thank you for that. And that goes a long way in promoting a very positive school environment. Thank you. Thank you all very much for what y'all do in the equity department. Uh, my next board meeting will be Tuesday, March 10th, 4 p.m. closed session, 5 p.m. open session. At this time, I would entertain a motion to go back into closed session. Motion by Mike Wooten, second by Mr. Ronald Johnson. Yes, uh, Mr. We Dr. Williams, will you read those, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I ask we enter into executive session for the purpose of consulting with the board attorney and to discuss personnel items in accordance with North Carolina General Statute 115C-319 and 143.318.11, subsections A1 and A3. So we've got a motion by Mr. Wooten, second by Mr. Johnson. All in favor say aye. 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 